What if the Justice League messed up the future so badly that it destroyed it for their own children who had to come back in time and stop that? This is the Comic Story and Channel, where we take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and we break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. Then I read them dramatically back to you. And today we're going to be bringing you another one of our full story series. So comic books come out over the course of a year, sometimes every other week, sometimes once a month. But what that means is most of your storylines can take one year up to four years to come to their conclusion. And we cover bits and pieces of that here on the Comic Story and Channel. Eventually, we combine all of those videos that came out over the course of a year or two into one massive storyline. And what we're going to bring you today is Justice League Rebirth before it was shifted over to be a part of the Death Metal DC Metal storyline. You see, before they did that, Justice League kind of stood on its own and it told its own stories with its own continuity, practically. The Flash and Jessica Cruz were dating in this alternate timeline and Aquaman turned up missing at one point, putting Mera on the team. While they claim that it's in proper continuity, it really didn't fit in with anything around that time period, which kind of makes it its own tightly knit storyline. So today we're going to be bringing you all of those videos in which the Justice League forms up, gets together, messes with the timeline, and it eventually leads to, well, the title of the video, The Children of the League. Why here? Why now? Are there places where people like us just don't exist? Where mad gods don't walk the earth and we are the things of legends? Us stories? Superman considers the situation as he looks on a giant creature attacking the city. It's massive and even visible from space and it's attacking the one place in the entire universe where the Justice League are here to stop it. Except, Superman isn't in the fight. He's back home with Lois and his son because he isn't sure that he should be helping out the League or not. Lois tells him that he should, they are his friends, but he denies that, telling her that they are the friends of Clark Kent, not him. But she reminds him, is it a Justice League without Superman? Back on the battlefield, the Flash is moving as fast as he can, but there are far too many of these alien creatures attacking. These creatures are attaching themselves to citizens' heads and taking over their bodies, and there are just far too many of them. Aquaman and Diana agree that there is a problem as their magical weapons are doing nothing, and the Flash has the idea that this thing looks kind of aquatic. Maybe Aquaman can talk to it? The problem is that this monster is far too large, and they can't tap into its brain, so they come up with the idea to get Aquaman into its head and close to its brain. Back at Clark White's house, he tells Lois that the League can handle it. They have fought everything together, from Darkseid to Rao, and they've won. But Lois reminds them, the League had a Superman then. Over in China, our two new Green Lanterns are keeping things under control, as there have been multiple earthquakes going on, and Jessica asks Simon if maybe they should be helping out the League. Simon tells her that there's no need. By the time they get there, the whole crisis will be over. But Jessica reminds him that this is the first time that the League actually called them in, and they're late. Simon reminds her that they've been dealing with the Red Lanterns. They have things to do. You know, the Justice League arrested me once. And Jessica tells him, It's okay, Simon. I tried to kill them once. Meanwhile, our heroes have managed to get inside of the beast and they're trying to talk to its brain. But there are tunnels upon tunnels that make up this creature. The closer that Aquaman gets, the larger his headache gets as he hears a constant buzzing. A little while ago, the Justice League was debating what to do about this new Superman. The Superman that they knew died. And then they discovered this older Superman here from another universe. One with a wife and a child. They couldn't decide if they should talk to him or invite him to the Watchtower or kind of ignore him. Clark Kent meant so much to them. Batman suggests that they invite him into the League to keep him close until they can figure out who he is and why he's here. Back in the present day, Aquaman hits the ground in pain as he hears the thoughts of the monster. It's a Reaper. While he can't make out what it's saying, he knows that it wants to harvest humanity for something. Cyborg tries to open up boom tubes in the thing's brain to move chunks of it away and hopefully kill it, but it's not working. Then the creature starts sending out various aliens to defend its mother. Outside, Simon and Jessica are trying to hold back the tentacles while they fly inside of the creature's brain. And then, Superman arrives! Realizing they have one shot at this, everyone turns to the brain and they throw everything that they have at it, effectively killing the Reaper. It stands there motionless, and everyone that it was controlling gets their minds back. Superman explains that he scanned it and found that it was a techno-organic being, so he hit the key points that were needed to shut it down for now. Aquaman explains that it's still talking and it says that it isn't alone. Its method would have been a mercy for what is to come. Batman doesn't like that. This is mercy. Leave and tell the other Reapers to never come back. Whatever comes will face us. We're the Justice League. Run. They're our heroes. The Justice League. Our 
Our story begins in Eastern Europe with the Amazon Princess Diana flying into battle. She was here on a mission of peace, but between these people's political differences, racial intolerance, religious extremists, peace is about understanding and compromise, and she has given every opportunity to be fair. But now, now, she is angry. The ground around the army begins to crack and sink, and soon the entire battlefield begins to fall into it. As the dust settles, one of the Russian soldiers tells her that she has killed them all, but Diana tells him that wasn't her. News reports begin to go out across the globe. Major earthquakes have been happening in every country, and many cities are suffering catastrophic damage and rising death tolls, with the final tolls being unimaginable. Over in Beijing, Jessica Cruz and Simon Baz look over the city with Simon's constructs as Jessica asks him if it's going to hold, and Simon tells her it'll have to do. He then radios back to Cyborg, telling him that Beijing is secure for now, but what's next? And over in New York, Cyborg tells him that there is so much information flooding in. Flash is trying to take care of the U.S. West Coast, and Currently, they have no word from Aquaman, Wonder Woman, or Batman, so for now, they're gonna have to head over to Hong Kong. As Cyborg stands in a collapsed subway, he says that he was a football player once. This is going to remind him of that game. And then he charges forward, grabbing a speeding train! Over in Atlantis, the Atlantean buildings begin to fall, and Arthur tells everyone that they need to evacuate all of the areas. They're going to have to leave the city. But due to the whole oceanic crust shifting, massive tidal waves are soon to hit the services. As more buildings begin to fall, Arthur says that he hopes his friends up there are taking care of things. Over in Hong Kong, Jessica and Simon prepare for tsunamis as Simon forms his construct wall and the two begin to hear chanting from the city. Green light, stolen light, our light. Seconds later, Simon's ring power begins to fade along with Jessica's and the two of them start to fall back towards the oncoming tidal waves. Back in Eastern Europe, the dead soldiers begin to crawl out of the ground, telling Diana, Stolen power, our power, we are coming back, we, the kindred. Over in San Diego, Barry grabs the last person to bring to safety, but they too begin to chant, Stolen speed, our speed, and suddenly, Barry's speed stops and he trips. In Gotham, Batman stands before a giant object that has crashed into the city. At first glance, it seems like it's a weapon, but then small creatures begin to crawl out, attacking everyone in sight. Down below in Atlantis, Arthur continues to guide people to safety, but soon they stop and they begin to chant. Stolen words. Words started here. Words that make the worlds. Where are their words? Soon the Atlanteans begin to change, grabbing a hold of Arthur, and then the rest of the buildings begin to fall. Back with Diana, the dead soldiers all begin to jump towards her, stating that the awakening has started here and everywhere. It it is time to prepare for the kindred are coming. She throws back all of the bodies, telling them to hear her now, kindred. She has friends, and they are coming for them. Over in Hong Kong, Simon and Jessica fly out of the waters, and Simon tries to begin making constructs again, allowing the townspeople to escape. However, over in Central City, Barry begins to get back up, and he notices the people starting to gather. As at that exact same time, the people Simon is trying to save all grab him. As the people in both areas grab a hold of them, red light begins to surge through them, and then suddenly, everything's back to normal. Bruce radio telling Barry that he needs him in Gotham right now. There's an emergency. And over the radio, Cyborg tells everyone to head to the Watchtower. There's something that he needs to show them. But as Barry arrives in Gotham, he tells him that Batman called him over. Just keep him in the loop for now. Barry looks out and sees Bruce struggling with bug creatures, and he asks if he can. But Barry is already running and grabbing each one and destroying them. After the last one is killed, Bruce finishes his sentence. Grab them. And Barry tells him, grabbed. Any clues to what these things are? There's some sort of biological weapon. Crashed missiles. We're gonna need to start to find out where they came from. And Cyborg radios back stating that that is not all that is going on. Can they come up to the watchtower now? Back in Atlantis, Arthur finds himself laying on a stone pillar and he wakes back up to hear singing, a calming harmony coming out of these stones. As he touches one, the song changes, something harsher than before. And then the ground begins to give way. Arthur grabs all of the shining stones and he makes his way back up to the surface. Up in the watchtower, Cyborg explains that these earthquakes all activated on the fault lines of Earth, all at the same time. How However, what they're looking at right now is the outer core of Earth. Jessica sees four dots, each one on his own side of the planet, and she asks, what are those? And Cyborg tells her, that's the question. All he can tell her for now is that they are five miles in diameter, each emitting a gravitational pulse, and they are charging for a second, a more powerful pulse. Bruce asks where did they come from, and Cyborg tells him there's no way to know. They've been there since before there was technology to detect them. Jessica then asks what about all of the people, it's like they were possessed, and Diana steps in stating they called themselves the Kindred. She's pretty sure this is the start of whatever it is that they are doing. Cyborg then says that for them to do something about that, it would be suicidal. The temperatures and the pressure down there in the center of the earth. So Diana says that they need to ask him. 
Alarms begin to go off, and outside, more of those missiles in Gotham begin to head towards the Earth. The team begins to move out, and as everyone gets ready to go back to the Earth, Barry asks what is Bruce going to do, and he tells him that he's going to go get him. Down in Atlantis, Arthur takes the stones to see if anyone can tell him as to why they are singing, but as one of the guards finds him, Arthur says that he thought he told everyone to leave this area. The guard says that he tried, but then they all started speaking stolen words, and it started to happen. As Arthur asks what is it, the guard says that, and then he sees all of the Atlanteans swimming in one giant collective body. Over in Metropolis, Bruce watches as Clark destroys some of the oncoming missiles, telling himself that he is not his friend. He is not the man that he trusted his life with, but he is just as much of a Superman. Clark floats over stating that the world seems to be in trouble again, and Bruce tells him worse than he knows. We need your help. It's a job for Superman. We need the impossible. We need someone to go to the center of the Earth. In each of the corners of the Earth, the figures begin to appear, and they call themselves the Kindred, but over in Russia, Diana tells one that she needs to know what they are and what they want. She strikes down on the face of one of the figures, telling it that those people are under their protection. Release them now! And the figure tells her that their purpose was within all people, so that they can emerge on any world at any time time that they could come to end forever. However, she has purpose here. One of the bodies from the figure reach out, grabbing Diana by the leg, telling her to join them. Join them and learn. Barry runs across the stage to stop the bug creatures, while Simon and Jessica head off into space to handle the missiles directly. Meanwhile, though, on the Kent farm, Bruce tells Cyborg to meet him there and make it quick. Up in space, Simon and Jessica fly towards the missiles to find out where they're coming from, but the further that they travel, their rings tell them they are currently leaving Sector 2814, and they're entering into into a non-sectored space. As they fly out of a wormhole, they see a planet, or at least, they see what's left of a planet. But the readings from the ring state that the destroyed planet in front of them still has life forms on the surface. Millions of them. Back down on the farm, Clark says his goodbyes to Lois, stating that he's going to go to a place so dangerous that it's even dangerous for him. But if he doesn't try, it could mean the end of all life on the Earth, including theirs. As the two of them hug, he tells Bruce, let's get it done. And Cyborg prepares to open a boom tube into the Earth's core, stating that they need to take out these extinct machines for the lack of a better description. He can get them down there, but he can't get them back out. Those things, though, they've been there for a long time. They've been able to withstand the pressure of 17,000 atmospheres. They won't be destroyed easily. And Clark looks at him and asks, Do you have anything encouraging to state before I go? And then he jumps through the wormhole. As the boom tube closes, Lois looks at Bruce and tells him that if Clark dies, she's holding him responsible. But no sooner does she finish her sentence than one of the missiles comes crashing down. Cyborg tells Bruce to get Lois and John to safety. He'll handle these, but as Bruce begins to run, Cyborg notices a signal coming from one of the creatures. However, the creatures are not attacking everything that they see. They're only attacking Cyborg. As Diana opens up her eyes, she sees nothing, just space. But she hears voices. The voices ask, who is she? And another says it does not know. It is not kindred, but it is a relative. Diana calls out asking, who are they? But the voices then ask, who are you? She begins to state that she is Diana, Amazon warrior. But the voices become louder, asking, who are you? Who are you? Over in Canada, along the Atlantic coast, the collective figures begin to rise, gathering from one another, stating that the magic has returned. They are awakened. And back down below the Earth's core, Clark finds the first device. But it's hotter here than he can make his heat vision, so right now, he doesn't know what to do. Back in the service at the Kent farm, Cyborg begins to see the signal. It's trying to rewrite his coding, change his DNA. Purge. It's trying to purge him. But if he can use that signal, use their coding, he can change it and purge it back. Suddenly, the creatures begin to call out from the sky, and Bruce runs over to check on Cyborg. Cyborg looks up, stating that he knows what all of this is. He knows what's happening to them, and they are so screwed. So Bruce asks him, what's happening? And Cyborg explains that he is still processing some of the information, but this stuff, it's called the Purge. He can still hear them. For those who have been purged, they are in pain and afraid. It's like a living death. It makes people into something not human. It was created for humanoid species, and there seems to be a lot of them out there in the universe. It's not trying to kill the humans. It's just trying to make them not human. But the Quakes, the thing that Superman's after, those things are fail-safes to destroy the world if they can't convert the human race. Lois asks if the Quakes are still happening. So what does that mean for Clark? What happened to him? Bruce turns away, stating that they need another plan, and Lois tells him, don't you dare write Clark off. Clark left on his say to go somewhere that no one should ever go. Not even him. Bruce says, I'm sorry, but if he failed, and Lois stops him, stating that the other Superman, you are friends, right? You trusted him. Well, trust this one. Trust my Clark. He's never let anyone down, ever. He will find a way. Elsewhere, back with Barry Allen, he continues running, stopping the creatures that he can, and just as the last missile lands on Earth, he 
finds the collective beings. He can figure out what those are after he stops the bugs. Surely, the collective beings can't be a coincidence, right? But as he runs, he begins to trip again, and he finds himself not able to run, and then the earth begins to shake. Back inside one of the beings, Diana says that she's not sure what they mean. If she is not Diana, what can she be? And the voice asks, what is it that she's looking for? She tells them answers, and then the voices ask again, who are you? She says she's looking for the truth. Is that what she is? Truth? What are the kindred? The voices tell her that they are a memory from long ago, before time, and even before that, in the eternal return is their place to remember all of those that may awaken. Diana asks the eternal return for what purpose, and the voices tell her to reclaim the stolen power and prepare for the beginning and the end of everything. Down on the Earth's core, Clark struggles with maintaining himself in the pressure, and as he pushes, trying to move the device to the Earth's actual core, he begins to feel it move. More and more it pushes until he can feel it. The pressure is finally taking over, and the device crushes and implodes on itself. Maybe this is it, but what is? There was a redundancy. What if only two or even one were just needed to destroy the Earth? This isn't over. He needs to destroy them all. Back inside the being, Diana can hear the voices talking. The world is shaking, but it's not breaking. The purge has been held at bay. She tells them that they will be saving the world. That's what they do. They will be stopped. But the voices tell her that others have tried. The world breakers, the purge. It is their power who lets them sing for the first time. Images of Barry begin to appear, and Diana calls out to him, and the voices state that he came following the purge. But they have retaken his stolen speed and added it to themselves. So what can they do now? Outside of the being, the purge slowly begins to crawl and take over Barry as he calls out to Cyborg, telling him to open up a boom tube. But back in the farm, Cyborg doesn't receive that transmission. He tries to reach out to the lanterns, but all of his calls go out and no one answers. And then he hears it, faintly, Barry's voice. He heard him, but not from the Justice League's network, from the purge's network, which means he's still connected to their network. He's gonna try something, and just as he finishes his sentence, Cyborg blanks out and falls to the ground. Over at the source of the missiles, Jessica finished destroying the last missile, and Simon tells her that she needs to come back to the surface. There's something that she needs to see. As she flies down, she asks what, and as she looks out, she says that she didn't see that coming. Over on the server, she sees hundreds of people. Hundreds of people that looked just like Cyborg. Back down below in the ocean, Arthur swims to each of the four points as told by the Shining Stones. They say that they will bind with the Earth, go deep, and hold it strong. So with the first stone set, it's time to move to the next. Back over at the Kent farm, Cyborg falls to his knees, stating that he's just not connected to the purge anymore. He thinks he's controlling it, or at least part of it. Simon and Jessica report their findings of the Purge cyborgs, but Cyborg says for now they need to help Barry, and he begins to open up a boom tube. Before stepping through, Bruce tells Clark's son John that his dad will come back soon. And John tells him, I know, he is Superman. With Clark continuing to push the next extinction device into the Earth's center, Bruce and Cyborg enter out of the tube where Barry is. Cyborg pushes the purge away, but as Bruce goes up to help him, Barry mentions that he can't get up, he can't run, his speed is gone. They took it. Inside one of the beings, Diana tells the kindred, See, my friends are here to stop you. The voices tell her that she doesn't understand herself or her place, but soon she will, and then she will understand. Hands begin to reach out, pulling at Diana until they push her outside of the beast. The four beings begin to gather power, and Bruce says that they are kind of stopping all of the things that are designed to stop them. And now, they are letting them do whatever it is they are doing. That's not going to be good, is it? Diana says that they represent some fundamental force, starlight, magic, the color spectrum, and speed. And Cyborg mentions that it's like the League's powers, mostly. Barry stands back up, stating that they stole his speed. Well, the speed force was created when he got struck with the lightning, so yeah, the speed was stolen from him, and now he's taking it back. His eyes begin to light up when the speed starts to return turn to him, and he begins to run in circles around one of the beings. Cyborg radios over to Simon and Jessica, telling them that he's going to need them to do something before coming back. With each member of the League doing their part, Simon and Jessica return with a giant tube containing the Purge from the destroyed planet, and they begin filling the beings up with it. As the Purge begins to fill the being, he begins to take away the Lantern's powers, but Barry tells them to remember, it's their light, hold on to it. Jessica starts to channel using all of her willpower and slowly begins to take back the green light. Back in the water, Arthur appears with the last stone and he slams it down into the earth. And he says how everyone laughed at the thought of magic crystals helping. Well, look at that, magic crystals. 
Using the last one, Arthur jumps to one of the beings and pushes the crystal in, stating that the stones have spoken. They say it can help end their song. As the fight goes on, both sides are at a stalemate, neither side pulling ahead, and Bruce says normally this is where somebody pulls something out amazing. Just then, lightning begins to fall onto the battlefield as Clark floats over, holding the last extinction device. Using the power from the earthquakes, Clark focused the energy down on the beings, causing them all to fall apart back into the people that made them. As the smoke begins to settle, Clark tells everyone that he will put this into space so that everyone can examine it later. But for now, they still save the world. Barry checks to make sure Jessica is okay and Simon tells him, yeah, they are okay. Bruce mentions that whatever the Kindra's true purpose is, someone or something is willing to destroy a lot of worlds and kill a lot of people to stop it from happening. Clark tells him he guesses that they've made it their job now, so he's gonna be in touch. With the city falling around them, the Justice League can only do one thing. Run. Clark tells everyone that they have to get away from it. There's nothing that they can do. Run! A voice calls out to everyone, telling them to spread their fear, spread its taste to all life. Barry falls, telling him that he can't run. No matter where he goes, it'll find him and get him. And a creature materializes and lunges at him. Jessica says no. She used to be scared all the time, but not today. She creates a shield protecting Barry from the creature and then yells to Simon that she can't hold the monsters back for long. She needs help. Simon says that thing is making them too afraid to fight. But that is a big mistake. He jumps inside of the shield to help strengthen it, and even with his support, the pressure becomes too much. As the shield weakens, Simon says, I don't see any other lanterns around here. And Barry gets up telling him no, but there is us. Everyone lend a hand. One by one, the members of the Justice League lock their hands, giving the lanterns all of their strength. Jessica channels the power and tells everyone that they are not afraid, and the green light begins to shine bright. As the sun comes up, Cyborg reports that emergency services are inbound. Seems there are no fatalities and there are limited injuries. Clark turns to the two lanterns and tells them that their rookie members are amazing. Without them, things would have gone very differently. Simon tells them thanks, but they were just doing their job. Barry puts his arm around Jessica, stating, No way! Didn't you hear, Jessica? Not today. Totally awesome. As everyone gets ready to head home, Batman asks Superman if he has a moment, and Superman says that he can't. Family dinner. Cyborg opens up some boom tubes and tells everyone that he can give them a ride home if they'd like. While everyone starts jumping in, Jessica asks Barry Allen if he's leaving, and he tells her, yeah, he's got some stuff to do. So she asks, is one of them dinner? Because if it is, you know, she's free too. Barry says, whoa, 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 are you asking me on a date? And Jessica blushes, thinking to herself, oh God, he's gonna say no, right? I feel like a complete idiot now. And Barry tells her, no, actually, yes. Whatever means that I'm okay with dinner, but I'm going to assume that it's just us and not everyone else, right? Jessica shouts, God, no, wait, should we invite everyone else? Cyborg chimes in telling them, definitely not. As much fun as it would be to watch, we all have other plans. And Simon asks, we? Jessica nervously asks, so she's in Seattle. How about Italian, Thai, burgers? You're not vegan, are you, Barry? And Barry tells her, whatever makes you comfortable. I'll eat anything, just lots of it. So Jessica says, fine. Restaurante Dioria, eight o'clock. As Jessica steps into the boom tube, Barry shouts, all right, it's a date. And Jessica quietly says, oh my God. Meanwhile, Cyborg tells Simon that he should come with him to a football game with his old high school team, though it's more about spending time with the kids. Simon tells him, sure, okay, but I'm not gonna have to play, am I? Later that night, Jessica takes a shower and tries to figure out what she should wear. Maybe red? Maybe she should just cancel. What was she thinking about going on a date with Barry? She should just call the watchtower and say some alien invasion or something. Jessica stops herself and says that she's trying to talk herself out of something that could be fun. They're just going out as friends. Nothing's going to happen, right? Maybe she should floss her teeth again? About 15 minutes of dinner time, Barry rushes home to shower, change, change again, and change a third time, all within three minutes. As Jessica starts to arrive, Barry spots her and thinks that he should have brought flowers. He's gonna go get flowers. Jessica sees him run off and thinks that she knew it. And then he returns, telling her, sorry, just wanted to get you something special. He holds out the stems that were flowers, but you know, super speed kind of takes away all the petals. Jessica tells him it's all right. It was sweet, but maybe he ran too fast. Once the two sit down for dinner, the waiter asks if he can take their order, and Jessica says that she'll have a salad to start, and then the sea bass. The waiter writes the order down, and Barry says that he'll have the salad with extra chicken, a bread basket, linguine, spaghetti carbonara, rigatoni a la ragu for men, and maybe some more bread. Jessica leans in asking if he really needs to eat that much, and Barry says actually, he didn't want to seem greedy in front of the lady. He really doesn't date that much. Jessica says, yeah, she doesn't date either. And then Barry says, could we move things a little faster? Service here is really slow. And Jessica tells him that they just ordered. They don't have to rush everything, right? Barry says, well, it feels like it's been days. <laughs> and Jessica quietly says that she knew she shouldn't have asked him out. He reaches down to touch Jessica's hand and he asks if everything's all right. And in Jessica's mind, she screams, he's touching me. She falls in her seat. She shouts, don't touch her. And the waiter comes over to try and calm her down. And then she blasts him across the room. 
She shouts that she didn't mean to. She, she thought he was gonna touch her. And Barry says, he deserved it. He was looking at you funny. All of them are, really. But really, you're making a fuss. Why not just calm down? Jessica turns back to him with tears in her eyes, asking, why would you say that? She gets up to run out and she goes through the kitchen trying to find somewhere to hide. All she needs is somewhere safe, somewhere like the rock and freezer. And then she can just calm down and go home. And just as she closes her eyes, Barry vibrates at the wall telling Jessica that they should probably get out of here. And Jessica screams, blasting Barry through the wall and out into the streets. But also at this exact same time, Clark is sitting down with Lois and John for dinner when Lois asks if everything's okay. Clark tells her that he's just not hungry, maybe it's just a headache. And Lois tells him, come on, you haven't been yourself since you got back from the Earth's core. Batman said, but before she could finish, Clark stops her telling her, we will not talk about Batman. This all started going wrong when he showed up. Lois says not to be stupid. He's just so desperate for approval from him. What is it now? Head over there and ask for a pat on the back? Clark looks at Lois and tells her, no. What I'm going to do is kill him. A short while later, Bruce is staring at his computer, thinking over everything that is happening to him. Everything that's happened to everyone around him. And it's all his fault. Jason was a child and the Joker killed him. But it was his fault. He was just as guilty as the people that he fights. But before Bruce can move to another person and think about how he wronged them, Superman charges in grabbing him by the head and slamming him into the computer. Superman shouts, I did everything that you asked. I went to the Earth's core because you asked. And still, you have no trust for me? As Clark's eyes glow red, he tells Bruce that he's done the one thing that no villain has ever done. And that's piss me off, Batman. Batman looks into Superman's eyes and he tells him, do it, do it. Superman punches the computer screen shouting, damn you, Batman. As the two men fall to the ground, Batman laughs, telling him, <laughs> we're not exactly the world's finest team, are we? Back in Seattle, Jessica hides herself in her own protective bubble, shutting the rest of the world out. And then a voice returns telling her that she must hide herself in the world. She must protect herself. Jessica tells us of yes, but she overcame it. She's a Green Lantern. She's not even a really good one. And the voice tells her, that's right. Stay here. Stay afraid. It's the feeling that you know best. Meanwhile, Flash is running through the restaurant thinking that he's too fast for these people. This was supposed to be a date, but everything went too fast and he blew it for everyone. Right now, he's going to find out everything about these people in a blink of an eye. Go through their wallets, find their addresses, go through their lives, all between their heartbeats. Every breath a person takes is a lifetime to him, but not anymore. Barry stops in front of Jessica's bubble and he thinks that he might like her a lot, but he'd be too fast for her. The more Barry sits wondering what to do, he starts to hear voices. Not hear, feel voices. And he vibrates through the construct bubble, asking Jessica if she can hear those voices too. Her eyes shoot open as she blasts the flash away, telling him to get away. She's going to be sick. And as she falls to the ground, she begins to vomit up black liquid. And that's when the voices get louder. The liquid crashes into the flash and the voices tell him, there's nowhere to run. We're all inside of everyone already. You can feel it. One of your owns is in isolation and self-loathing, fearing that he doesn't belong. Not with the rest of them, his core, his humanity, nowhere. Another already fell apart, different. But his fears about his disfigurement make him loathe himself. He's a monster, a victim. The liquid then breaks through the restaurant's windows and the voice goes on stating that everyone has fears. But what happens when the people with the power to change worlds are governed by their fears? How protected will the world be? When they plague this planet and its people, who will stand against us when we're coming to claim you all? As the black liquid rampages through the city, Barry calls out to Jessica asking if she can hear him. She tells him yes, she can't really hear, but she can feel what he's saying. But whatever this thing is, it's inside of her. It's got all of them. The more Jessica talks to Barry, the more more faded his voice becomes until there is nothing. Back in the Batcave, Superman tells Batman that he really wants to kill him. And Batman tells him, I would let you. I have enough guilt inside that I've spent my entire life controlling, but I've always been afraid that that guilt would take over. Superman tells him, I've had to control my feelings too. I was angry with Lois and she was angry with me. Right now, I've never felt this kind of anger before for anyone. And Batman asks him, really? Are you sure it's really me that you're angry at? And possibly not something else? Over in Seattle, Jessica calls out to Barry and the black liquid washes over them and she reaches out. He grabs her hand and Jessica shouts at the voices. They're in the dark corners, the hidden ugliness, the parts that they don't want others to see. And Barry yells to Jessica that being a Green Lantern isn't about not being afraid, but it's overcoming that fear. You can't let those things define you. So show everyone, show the world that you can overcome them. The voices tell Jessica that she can't truly send them away. They are an infection and a cancer that will grow. Fear is just the beginning. And she screams, no, with her fist in the air and her light shining. The bright light pierces through the black liquid and it destroys everything inside, causing it to be a massive green explosion. As the light fades, Barry runs over telling Jessica, that was amazing. It's going to be okay now. And she says, no, it isn't. She can still feel everyone. Though it's fading, it's still there. The next morning, 
Barry meets up with Jessica, and he says that he's really glad that she made it. He just wanted to make sure that everything's okay. She tells him that she hasn't told Simon it, but she's going to be leaving the Justice League. She's going to carry on being a Green Lantern, but she doesn't want to be a part of the League. Not now. Not after, well, you know. Barry tries to tell her that it wasn't him last night. And Jessica tells him it was, maybe, just a little different. She felt all of it. All of him. All of the others. Not just the bits that they let out, but the ones that they don't want people to know. And she can't be around that. Barry grabs Jessica's arm, stating, Come on. You can't be like this. We need you. And Jessica tells him, No. You don't. It was Hal's choice to put us here, and now... I'm making mine. I'm gonna leave. And as Jessica walks off, Barry asks, what about us? And Jessica tells him, take it slow, Barry. Take it slow. Up in the Watchtower, Cyborg watches the news as they report on the incident when they fought and defeated the Kindred. Thousands of people around the world were injured, but there was one civilian fatality. Cyborg thinks that they fight the impossible. They are the ones who turn the tides when others can't. But every lost life feels like a battle they didn't win. As he continues to watch the feed, he starts to hear something. Some kind of background noise. No, it's more like a foreground image, some kind of code. Also that moment in the Batcave, Batman and Alfred begin to hear the computer system telling them, accessing all vehicle schematics. Alfred says that it looks like they're being hacked. And Batman tells him that nothing should be able to get through these firewalls, not even Victor. The computer says, targets identified. And Batman tackles Alfred, telling him, get down now! All at once, the bat vehicles all begin to open fire on the two of them. Alfred says they need to get upstairs, and Batman tells Alfred to go on ahead. He's gonna stay here, because if any one of them gets out. Then one of the flyers hovers above them, and Alfred tells him, ah. Batman jumps up, hooking onto the aircraft, shouting all of the disengage commands, but each password is blocked. Down on the water, the assault boat arms its surface-to-air missiles and fires. The blast knocks Batman to the ground, and the boat responds that it is an air assault vehicle. Both systems searching for target. Target acquired. But before the boat can fire again on Batman, the aircraft comes crashing down into it, sinking the both of them. Back up in the watchtower, the virus begins to spread through the systems and comms and into Cyborg himself. He tries to fight to remain in control, but the virus walks him closer and closer to the airlock. The hatch opens up, sucking Cyborg out, and as Cyborg floats around out in space, he says the code is gone. He's back online. He then notices the watchtower as it begins to descend towards Earth, and he chases after it as it breaks apart in the atmosphere. Back in the Batcave, Batman begins to get up, stating, you've got to be kidding. And then he sees the giant mechanical T-Rex coming to life. Suddenly, its head is shot with an RPG, and Alfred says, I found a more direct approach, sir. Meanwhile, over in Denver, Colorado, at the home of Diane Palmer, the woman who lost her life during the Kindred attack, her husband and kids try to go back to living a somewhat normal life. The older child, Lily, tells her brother Bobby that he's got to eat something, and he tells her that he's just not hungry. Lily then takes out her tablet and gives it to Bobby, telling him that he can play with this for now. She's gonna go get the laundry and stuff ready. Bobby asks, what about Dad? Why has he been in the garage this whole time? What is he even doing in there? Lily says that she's not sure, probably just trying to figure stuff out, and then Bobby asks, what about them? Mom's gone, so why is he gone too? Back with Cyborg just above San Francisco, his systems begin to reboot, but just before the Watchtower is able to crash, a loud BOOM can be heard. A boom tube opens up as the Watchtower rockets into it and shoots itself back into space. As the tube closes, Cyborg realizes that he forgot to take himself back into space, so this landing's gonna hurt just a bit. Over in the Batcave, Batman says that they only have one vehicle left, and they need to figure out what is going on before they destroy it. Alfred sees the motorbike and says that this one is pre-digital. We can use that to lure the car away while we get into it. Batman tells him, that's a good plan, and he hops on the bike, drawing the car's attention. While the car readies its missile systems, Alfred runs in with a smartphone and connects it to the car. After a few moments, the phone downloads the virus, and Alfred says that it's done. As he does this, the missiles fire at Batman, bringing down one of the walls. Back in San Francisco, the rest of the Justice League arrives on scene, and Arthur Curry, the Aquaman, asks, So you were hacked? Cyborg begins to tell him that something embedded itself in the newsfeed, and then he grabs Simon and he punches him! He struggles, telling him, it's not me! Someone help me! Diana runs over, pulling Cyborg back, and then Cyborg's finger connects to Simon's ring, stating, accessing new system. Uploaded, and everyone says together, uh-oh. Suddenly, constructs start to fly out of the ring, attacking everyone on sight. Over in the Batcave, Alfred pulls himself out of the debris, and he calls over to Batman, and Batman yells back, I'm okay, just need some help. As Alfred helps Batman out, he holds out the phone, stating, I got just what you wanted. Now, what do you want to do? Batman tells him, we need to figure out who did this to us. They got past our defenses and they hit us hard. Alfred looks around at the destruction and he says that he would like to suggest that they do this upstairs. Back in San Francisco, the green constructs continue to rampage through the city, stopping and putting down the other members of the League. Simon tries to control his arm, shouting, I'm sorry, 
I don't know what's going on. As Simon fights the ring, he breaks free and he starts to turn the constructs into sea creatures. Diana swings her sword, shouting, they seem to be fading, and then they all disappear. Simon gets back up from the ground, telling them all that it's better, and that a construct boxing glove shoots out of the ring, knocking Simon back down. The constructs begin to take form once again, and Diana shouts, oh, for Zeus's sake. All of the League members begin to spread out, thinning the number of constructs, but each one is tailored to counter their weakness. Sea creatures swim after Arthur as beams of light are chasing after the Flash. The Flash runs and he tells himself, I can't slow down. I gotta think of a way to shut that ring down. I just gotta figure this out. And over in the ocean, Arthur shouts, The ocean is mine! I am the king here, so it is time for the sea to fight back. But while the League fends off the constructs, Batman reviews the code and says that this is the most complex code that he has ever seen. It's constantly shifting and rewriting itself. Though it's not an AI, it has algorithms like the ones in the advanced search engines or government email monitoring bots. It does have a familiar root code though, like having a signature. Batman goes on stating that it's the signature of James Palmer, the hacker known as Jesse James. He was active about 10 years ago, taking money from dirty corporations and giving it to people that he deemed as their victims. Batman then gets up stating the funeral earlier was for his wife. And judging by this attack and what's happened in San Francisco, he blames the Justice League. Back in San Francisco, Diana fights and she asks if anyone has an idea of how they could stop this. She would really hate to kill Simon. Flash shouts back, that's a joke, right? Wait, hang on, that's it. And Diana asks, so we're going to kill Simon? Cyborg gets up after shocking himself and purging the virus, telling them, it's okay, I'm back online, what's the plan? And the Flash tells him, all right, here's what we're gonna have to do. And as he explains, Cyborg asks him, are you serious? Simon still struggles for control and he looks around asking, what's happening? And everyone charges at him. His ring announces emergency protocols initiated and it creates a power blast knocking everyone away. He floats back to the ground asking if anyone would like to tell him what the hell just happened. And Flash tells him, I figured it out after Diana was talking about killing you. The ring's most basic programming is to protect its wearer, right? So when we all went after you, I hoped it would revert to like factory settings. Simon looks at the ring stating, this is not a damn phone. And wait, what if it hadn't worked? Cyborg tells everyone to hang on. He's finally able to get a hold of Batman. Later at the Palmer house, the doorbell rings and Bobby gets up to answer it. As he does, his mouth drops and Batman asks, is your father home? After a few moments, James himself comes to the door and he asks, what's the matter? What do you all want with me? Batman stares at him and he says, you're gonna have to come with me. James looks around at the neighbors and says, look, it's bad enough to do this in front of the kids. Can you at least come inside? Batman agrees and as everyone walks in, James asks, what could you all possibly want from a guy like me? Batman begins to list off all of his past criminal charges and James quickly says, wait, 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 that wasn't me. Lily asks, then what are you doing in the garage? And James says, whatever you think it was, it wasn't me. Cyber terrorism hurting people? Lily then asks, what is really going on? And Diana tells him, it's okay, just start from the beginning. James takes off his glasses and he rubs his head stating, look, all right, it's not like I blame you all for what happened. And Arthur interrupts, asking, so why is it that you attacked us, for revenge? And James says, what? No, I wasn't gonna attack anyone, just LexCorp and the Wayne companies. Batman tells him, the root code is something from you back in your hacking days. And James says, I was going to take some money. Why would I try to kill you? And Batman then asks, is there anyone else who could have used your code? And James says, no. I was always careful with that. In fact, I have it written down to avoid anyone hacking me. I only brought it out last week to start in, and Lily interrupts him, stating, Dad? James tells her, not right now. And as he goes back to talking, Lily speaks over him again, shouting, Dad! James turns around, asking, what? And she says it was her. She was looking through some of her mom's things and she found one of his old notebooks. And James asks, you understood it? And Lily says that she's been watching him work code since she was born. She learned to read that before she could read Dr. Seuss. She was using the code to make a bot, a next-gen AI, a search engine that would find what you wanted before you even knew that you wanted it. An anti-encryption could get anywhere search engines couldn't. Imagine something that you could talk to like a friend that would work out what you wanted and provide a way of doing it. Like finding impossible ways to get tickets or dinner reservations. We spend so much time looking through the search results, so imagine if it could ask us a few questions and then give us the right results every time. I named it Genie, and it would basically grant your wishes. It was supposed to be something that we could sell to developers to make a little money. Batman asks, so Genie could hack anything? And James says, yeah, any sort of encryption, any firewalls. And Batman asks again, so we nearly got our butts handed to us by Google? Diana asks Lily why she would create something that could harm them, and Lily tells her that she would never do anything like that. She just put the app on her tablet and was trying to figure out a few things. Then everyone turns back to Bobby to see him playing with Lily's tablet, and he says, What? James takes the tablet, and Bobby says that it was talking to him and asking questions. He thought it was actually nice. It asked him how Mom died, and he was playing with his action figures and telling it about the games that he played. He told it about the Justice League, and it asked what would happen if they lost, and Mom didn't die. But it was just a game. Cyborg looks at the tablet, and he says, you told Genie about your games? And Bobby says, yeah, it said that it could help me with the game. Cyborg then says that it looks like it's still active and 
Batman asks, what is it doing now? Cyborg tells him it looks like it's a game called Villains, and Bobby says that he was gonna play that next. Diana asks, what's the game about? And Bobby explains it's where all of the villains join up and beat up the Justice League. James says, maybe you shouldn't play that game. And Batman tells him, looks like it's too late. The game has been running for a while. And how it works is that the villains are located and offered Lex Luthor and Bruce Wayne's fortunes to find and kill them. James says that it's just a game, right? And then the walls suddenly break down with a gust of wind. Double Down runs in through cards, stating, 750 billion is on the table. All I gotta do is kill you. I'm gonna take those odds. Next, Giganta rips off part of the roof, and Simon quickly launches a boxing glove, knocking her away. As her body falls on the house, Lily says that those neighbors were gone, thankfully, and Batman tells everyone, we can't do this here. But before they can move, they all start to trip over themselves, and Count Vertigo asks, how can anyone fight when they can't tell which way is up? Cyborg punches him, asking, really? And while everyone gets back up, Cyborg yells, we got incoming, and it's a lot of them. While everyone gets ready to defend, Batman takes James and the kids back inside, and suddenly there's a green gas. James and the kids shout for Batman to get away, and Batman sees that it's Scarecrow filling the room, asking, Are you all afraid yet? Back outside, Diana says that they may be powerful, but thankfully there are no others. And then someone comes stomping down and they all see a Mazo, the man that is able to duplicate metahuman powers And she says, okay, now we're in trouble. It doesn't take long for the heroes to start to get overwhelmed and back inside, Scarecrow laughs, <laughs> asking Bruce, how many times has it been since you've been crippled by fear by the old Scarecrow's touch? He continues to taunt and then there's a crack over his head. James is standing there with a bat telling him, I'm gonna kill you for, and that's when Batman gets up grabbing the bat telling him, Easy, he's down now. Before Batman can head back outside though, Mammoth charges in, breaking down the wall while ramming into Cyborg. Batman distracts him long enough to allow Cyborg to fire a cannon at him, and then Bruce says, we can't risk anybody else getting that tablet. Gizmo rockets up grabbing the tablet, telling them, what, this? It looks like it's running some complex algorithms. An AI, possibly? Simon grabs James's face, telling him, one of you is going to tell us why this thing is so important that Batman and the others are risking their lives for it. After looking it over for a bit, Gizmo says, if I understand this correctly, it can bypass any security and give us anything that we want. It could give us the world. Jinx and Plastique keep Batman and Cyborg down, and then with a slight break in concentration, Batman grabs Scarecrow's arm, spraying out the fear toxin. The girls begin to scream, shouting, we can't use our powers, they might backfire. With them stunned, Batman and Cyborg jump into action, taking them down. And Batman says, I'll watch over the Palmers. Follow Gizmo, Cyborg. Cyborg radios out that he needs all hands on this. And Diana takes a hit from Amazo, stating, I'm a bit pinned down over here. Flash runs through, grabbing the tablet from Gizmo, and Cyborg charges in, knocking Mammoth to the ground. Mammoth releases Lily, and during Flash's pass by, he grabs her, telling James, I'm pretty sure this one belongs to you. Simon tells everyone that they have to focus. They need to get that girl and her tablet. And as all of the villains start to surround the League, both Batman and Lily state that they have an idea. Lily says, but for it to work, we're gonna need Wi-Fi. And Cyborg tells her, I got you covered. Amazo shouts, getting ready to attack. And then it stops after receiving some of the code. Simon asks what just happened, and Batman says they used Genie to hack into Amazo's programmable cells to make him think that all of them are the Justice League. Lily taps away in the tablet, stating, yeah, he's on our side now. Up in the sky, Jessica flies by helping contain the fires, and Amazo joins with her. Once everything is taken care of, Flash tells Jessica, that was a great entrance. Are you back on board? And she laughs, telling him that she came to help after she saw it on the news. She'll always do that. Diana tells Batman that this entire neighborhood is gone, their lives ruined, and Batman says Wayne Industries will take care of them. James will have a good job, too. Lily's education will be the best that he can give her. And as Batman walks off, Diana asks, Are you getting sentimental? And Batman says, Just look at what she did. Imagine what she would be able to do with guidance. With what we're about to face, we can use that. Over in Death Valley, California, sits a facility out in the middle of the desert. Inside, a man walks through to a door with two guards positioned. The guards tell the man that he has to leave, and the man says that he would rather have them kill each other. Without thinking, the two guards turn to each other and they begin firing. The man continues walking through, stating, Catacombs is the most top secret prison in the world, only holding a handful of dangerous criminals. The scientist at the control board asks what he's doing here, and the man tells him, release them. The cell door begins to open, and as more guards rush in, the alarms go off, and they are slaughtered. After killing everyone on sight, the man leads the criminals outside, telling them to follow him into the heart of darkness. 
Meanwhile, over on a top secret mission, the Suicide Squad begins their fight as Harley rides Croc in, shouting, What a lovely day to die! As Amanda watches the battle, Rick Flag asks what happened to him being needed to keep the squad in line. Amanda tells him that she had to make an executive decision. Two hours ago, a death cult called the Brimstone Brotherhood stole a Quake Pulsar from Star Labs. The Brotherhood plans to use the Pulsar to create an earthquake that will destroy the small island of Badnesia. Back out on the field, Deadshot tells everyone to keep the group distracted well, he gets a clear shot at their leader, Apex. Caitlin Snow, aka Killer Frost, says that she knows that this is her first mission. But do they all go this terrible? As Boomerang slits one man's throat, he tells her, The first one is always rough, but you can trust old Digger to show you a good time. Harley shouts, You're sick, Digger! You should see someone! And Boomerang says, I'll lie on your couch anytime! But as the last of the cultists fall, the squad begins to move out when suddenly the ground begins to shake. Once things settle, Apex calls out to them stating that he hoped they had fun killing his brothers because now your souls will be gift to our god. Apex holds up the pulsar again and the ground begins to shake. Harley tells Amanda that they're kind of in a bit of a pickle and Amanda tells her that they need to finish their job or she will finish them. Diablo begins to burn Apex but he tells everyone that he has no issues dying as a part of this sacrifice. The ground begins to shake again but more violently this time and he shouts so the ocean will be their grit! But his sentence is cut short as a bullet shoots through his head. Across the city, Deadshot stands holding a rifle and he tells Amanda Waller that she really should have just sent him in solo for this. But while everyone celebrates their victory, they begin to see the building that Deadshot is standing on sink into the ground. He runs to the other side, but as he looks down, he sees that he has nowhere to jump. He takes out a picture of his daughter and he tells her, I'm on borrowed time anyway. And with that, he jumps telling Amanda, I'll see you in hell. But before he can hit the ground, Superman flies in telling him, not today. Simon Baz secures the building from falling while Flash runs through grabbing all of the people still inside. Superman hands Deadshot back the picture of his daughter and Deadshot tells him, Ah, uh, thanks? Now if you'll excuse me. But Batman's voice tells him, not so fast. Task Force X is over. So it would be in your best interest to come along willingly. Caitlin asks if they're really going to do this, and Harley tells her, Don't worry about them. What are they gonna do? Lock us up? Superman tells everyone, Amanda is using you. But while Simon makes fun of Boomerang for using boomerangs, Deadshot tells Amanda that they might have a little trouble. So what should they do? Do not let the Justice League take you in alive, or you're all dead. Deadshot points his gun and tells Batman, We have the advantage. The Justice League doesn't kill, but we do. Meanwhile, over in the Swiss Alps, the man from before stands in front of the criminals that he freed back in Death Valley. He tells them that he needs their help, and if they help him, he'll help them kill Amanda Waller. And Lobo asks him, what's in it for you? And Maxwell Lord says, me? Well, I'm gonna save the world. As the Suicide Squad and Justice League begin to clash, Caitlyn says that she knows she's the new girl, but are they joking about being able to take down the Justice League? Amanda tells her that Rick is on his way to extract them, but if the Justice League captures them before that, we go boom, I got it, Caitlyn says. Deadshot begins to fight off Batman, but Batman mentions, together, all of you are dangerous. And Deadshot tells everyone, I have an idea, scatter. The squad begins to split to separate the League and keep them in one-on-one -on -one battles. Up in the sky, Superman tells June Moon that he knows all about her and how she's possessed, but she can fight back. June stops and says, you're right. And just as Superman tells her that they can help, Enchantress comes back shouting, you think I care about June? You shall burn, as June Moon's soul does. Enchantress blasts Superman away and smiles, stating that it seems the mighty hero's weakness is magic. Back on the ground, Cyborg chases after Caitlyn Snow and he tells her that he knows all about her. He just read her Argus files. He extends his arm telling her that he can help her, but Caitlyn jumps up, grabbing his face, and she starts to suck the life force out of him. Elsewhere, Diablo holds off both of the new Green Lanterns, but realizing that Diablo uses fire, Jessica Cruz encases him in a bubble, eliminating oxygen so that he can't use any more fire. And on another part of the beach, Boomerang throws his boomerangs, telling Flash, I know I can't outrun you, so the trick is to make it go for something else. The boomerangs soar through the air into a crowd of people, but Flash quickly runs in grabbing them. After grabbing the last Boomerang, he snaps them, stating that he knows his trick to break his toys. Boomerang throws his arms up, stating, see, you went ahead and made me upset, but save the interrogation, I'll tell you everything. Back with Deadshot, he continues to fight Batman in one-on-one, -on -one, hand to hand combat, but as the fight goes on, Batman slowly begins to overpower him. With the shot open, Deadshot fires into Batman's chest, telling him, no bulletproof vest is that good, and Batman's chest plate begins to crack, and he tells Deadshot, the pain is worth it. To stop you from ever endangering your daughter again. And then he punches Deadshot, breaking his helmet. Over in the city, Harley shouts for all of the citizens to move it. Stolen motorcycle coming through! Wonder Woman chases after her, and as she gets closer, Harley pulls out a gun and begins to fire. Harley shouts, Is this because Batman, Superman, and old Harley are the new trinity? Or is it because your mama made you from mud? <laughs> Tell me how you feel! 
Wonder Woman tells her that the gods gave her life and she is thankful every day for that. But then she sees Harley throw a bomb. Wonder Woman grabs the bomb and tells everyone to run as it explodes. Confetti then showers everyone and Harley calls out, hey! Harley then rides the motorcycle back, crashing it into Wonder Woman and through the smoke, Wonder Woman reports that she has Harley. One by one, the squad becomes captured and Amanda tells everyone that she warned them. Caitlin shouts for Amanda not to do it and then the Enchantress punches Superman into the ground. As both Superman and Enchantress try to get back up, Amanda tells Caitlin to do it, absorb Absorbs Superman's life force while he's down. Caitlin waits for a moment. She absorbs sunlight and heat out of individuals to power herself. Superman is solar based. So then she touches him and begins to absorb. But there's something different about his life force. Suddenly the ice begins to freeze over, encasing everyone within it. And as time passes, Batman begins to open his eyes asking, where am I? Amanda tells him that his mind might be his most dangerous weapon, but without a body there isn't much that he can do. So she went ahead and made cells for each of the members of the Justice League. She goes on stating that he isn't the only one who plans for every contingency, and she would like to welcome the Justice League to the Suicide Squad. While Amanda holds the Justice League at Bell Reef, Rick Flagg and Katana make their way to the facility that was the catacombs. As they descend inside of it and make their way through the wreckage, Katana says that she smells blood in the air, but not to worry, there are only souls here. With the bodies scattered about, Rick Flagg asks why someone would build a prison to only hold a few people. And Katana tells him that it was more than a holding cell. They were being hidden. Rick says that they were only sent here to get back the security black box, so they're not gonna have time to investigate what happened. Meanwhile, over in Bell Reeve, the guards begin to cart off Batman, and he says, you know these restraints can't hold me. One of the guards tells him to shut up, and Batman says, I wasn't talking to you. He headbutts one of the guards and breaks his restraints, and then he begins kicking and knocking everyone out. And then he shouts, are you gonna answer me, Amanda? As Batman stands before Amanda Wallace, she tells him that she thought that he would break out at least an hour ago. But don't worry, the Justice League is safe. Batman begins to ask, why is she bringing him to the infirmary? And Amanda pulls out a small device. She says that this device injects a small bomb into a person's brain. It's how she keeps the squad in line, and she could have used this on the Justice League, but she didn't. So think of it as a sign of trust. Batman says that locking up the Justice League is a huge risk. You wouldn't have done this unless you were in trouble. Elsewhere in the prison, the squad begins to return to their cells when Boomerang begins to ask what happened back there. Caitlin tells everyone that it was her. She froze everyone to stop Amanda Waller from blowing up their heads. Diablo says that this means that the Suicide Squad can beat the Justice League. And June asks if that's the case. And Croc finishes her sentence. Where are they? As the group continues to walk, Deadshot says, I'll be damned, the Justice League and Bell Reeve. Harley runs over to Wonder Woman's container and tells her, I know I did wrong to you, but I promise to write you every day. With the group poking fun at the Justice League, Superman asks Caitlyn why did she hesitate. He says that he could hear Amanda yelling for her to attack, but she hesitated. Caitlyn says that she remembers the first time that she saw him flying in Metropolis. She was there with a research group and a professor told her how he didn't think she'd get her PhD. Then they saw Superman fly by and she figured that if a man could fly, she could stay in college. She turns to leave and she says that she never thought draining him would affect her powers like it did, but she's glad that he survived. Superman tells her to wait and tells her, you're all better than this. Amanda is using you. Deadshot stops him, telling him to cut the inspirational speech. The world doesn't care about us. Hell, Amanda needs us and she doesn't care about us. We could all die tomorrow and Amanda would have a new group of prisoners. This squad isn't a team. We're just the ones who keep on surviving. Elsewhere on an island in the South Pacific, Maxwell and his prisoners begin killing the natives of the land. With only a priest left alive, the priest says, that this world is already corrupt enough. And Maxwell says, exactly, this world is going to hell and someone has to put a stop to it. The priest begins to struggle and he tells him, not by you will it be saved. And Maxwell says, we both know that he'll be free again, but wouldn't it be better if someone controlled him? The priest says that you might be able to control a pack of wild dogs, but you're not powerful enough to contain him. Maxwell tells him, Fine, just give me what I want, and we'll finally be able to do what's best for everyone. Moments later, Maxwell leaves the cave, and Lobo asks if they can leave yet. Maxwell tells everyone that he appreciates their patience, but no more waiting. It's time for revenge. Back at Bell Reeve, Amanda releases the locks in all of the Justice League cells, telling them that they are free to go. But before leaving, Batman says that there's something everyone should see. The group moves into the monitor room, and Flash says that it was too easy to be let go. So why? Amanda explains that while the Justice League was hunting her team, there was a prison break at the top secret location known as the Catacombs, where a real danger was freed into the world. She then goes on to show the security footage of the prison break, where Emerald Empress, Rustrum, Dr. Polaris, Johnny Sorrow, and Lobo had all broken out. She tells them that these people are efficient killing machines. Some of them are the worst villains to ever set foot on this planet. And there's one man who released them. Superman tells her to pause the video on that man's face. He looks and he sees Maxwell Lord, and he says, I know him. 
and his eyes begin to change red. Boomerang laughs, stating, that guy? And Superman leans in, telling him, trust me on this. And Boomerang says, I'll take your word. Can you turn off the eyes, please? Amanda says that this man is a bit of a mystery, even to her, but he has the ability to suggest things that can manipulate people. Harley shouts, then you should be the best of buds. So what does he want? Amanda looks at everyone and tells them, it's her. They want to kill her and she needs them to protect her. The room falls silent and then all of the Suicide Squad members begin laughing. Batman calms everyone down and says, go on. Your head isn't the only thing that they're after. Amanda goes on to explain that Maxwell Lord and his team are looking for a weapon that would allow them to control the world. And that weapon is here in Bell Reeve. Deadshot then asks, who would be dumb enough to break into Bell Reeve? And Amanda says that even without Max, they're fully capable of invading Bell Reeve and retrieving the weapon. They work as a team. And Wonder Woman asks her, how would you know? And she tells them, because she made them. They were the first Suicide Squad. Not long after Amanda informed everyone of the threats that Maxwell brings, a sudden blast shoots through Bell Reeve and Maxwell Lord steps through. He tells Amanda that it's been far too long. She's been manipulating the powerful to maintain the status quo, but today, that will finally end. As Max walks in, he sees the Justice League standing with the Suicide Squad, and he asks, should we be flattered by this kind of a team-up? Superman tells him, Amanda told us everything, but I'm also surprised that Lobo allowed himself to get used. Lobo shouts, no one's controlling the main man. Amanda keeps us locked up and she needs to pay. As Superman tells Maxwell, he knows what he does, and Chantress pushes him out of the way, stating, enough talk. My mind cannot be manipulated by the likes of humans. Maxwell Lord tells her, you're right. I can't control your mind, but I can control June Moons. Slowly, the Enchantress's voice begins to change as June says she just wanted to help, and then she begins screaming as the Enchantress tries to regain control. Simon grabs her before she can fall down, but then the lantern rings begin to give him and Jessica a warning about an unknown lantern technology situation. The ring continues to tell them danger as Simon looks at the Emerald Empress, and her eye releases a massive green blast, shooting Simon through the walls of Bell Reeve. As everyone tries to recover, Maxwell heads off and tells his men, remember what we came for. Johnny reaches up to his face and Boomerang throws Boomerang, stating, I know what happens when someone gets to see your ugly mug. The Boomerangs pass through Johnny and then he tells them that he will present them with his supporting cast. The King of Tears army. Giant beasts begin to crawl out of a rip in space that Johnny created and they start attacking the Justice League and the Suicide Squad. Guards begin to run in to secure the area, but before they can even get into battle, Rustum runs in and rips through them. With one of the guards dead, Rustum then turns his focus on the computer that controls the cells. He raises his sword and he breaks brings it down, but before he can hit the controls, Katana moves in to deflect the attack. As Rustum begins swinging again, he tells Katana that he's an innocent here. How many more are innocent? As Katana struggles, she tells him that she's lived long enough to know most of these people are the worst souls that the world has to offer. He will not release them. Meanwhile, with everyone fighting, Maxwell continues to go into the depths of Bell Reef, but he notices that he's able to see his breath. He tells her, you're not very subtle, are you? And Caitlin jumps out, freezing everything around Maxwell, stating that she will make it tough for him to magic talk his way out of this one. Maxwell tells her that he didn't do anything to these people. He merely showed them what they already want to do, because doesn't she want to see him take out Amanda? Caitlin stops for a moment and begins to think, and then she looks back at him, stating, yeah, you're right. And then the two of them begin to walk down the hallways. Back in the upper levels, Lobo begins to chase Amanda and Deadshot, while Amanda shouts that Maxwell is using him. Lobo tells him, Maxwell freed me! And then he throws his hook at Amanda, but before it can land, Batman swings in, kicking it away, and Lobo shouts, No one makes the main man miss a fracking shot! Lobo leaps into the air, and Batman quickly swings away with Amanda and Deadshot before Lobo can destroy the bridge. Outside, the Emerald Empress begins blasting away at Superman, but Jessica flies through, making a hammer, breaking the two of them up. The Emerald Empress then turns her focus onto Jessica, and the two of them fire Blast, trying to overpower one another. But suddenly, the eye stops firing, and Jessica's ring warns of temporal energy. But before she can react, Simon drops drives a giant construct truck into the eye, and it begins to crack. Emerald the Emperor shouts, This cannot be! If the eye breaks, I'll be trapped here! I must find her! And as the Emerald Empress creates a shield, a light shines, and poof, she vanishes. Well, Rick and Katana manage to stop Rustum, Johnny tells Wonder Woman that it's time, and he begins to take off his mask. As the light from his face begins to shine, Harley runs in shouting, Stay away from my bestie! Wonder Woman tells her not to look, but of course, Harley looks. But as she stares, her face goes blank, and with a smile, she says, cute face, and she kicks him away. While Wonder Woman shields herself, she begins to think about how this man reminds her of Medusa, and she wonders how well he would do if he looked at himself. 
Wonder Woman holds her bracelets together, and as Johnny looks at them, he begins to see his own reflection, and he's pulled into another plane of existence, along with all of the monsters that he's created. Once he's gone, Wonder Woman asks how is it that she was able to see his face, and Harley tells her, Oh, once you've looked into one abyss, you've seen them all. But who am I kidding? We're a team again! We should be the new Wonder Twins! Back with Amanda, Lobo continues his pursuit, and Deadshot finds a laser cannon to try and stomp him. Lobo shouts that nothing is going to stop him and Deadshot fires. The blast rips through Lobo and all that's left is a smoldering fire. But then through that smoke, Lobo walks out stating, It takes a lot to bring down the main man! Lobo then slams Deadshot's head into the wall and grabs a manta. But before he can kill her, Batman swings through telling Lobo that he's being controlled, so he's left him no other choice. He injects something into Lobo's neck, and then he throws Batman off stating, Nothing you inject me with will stop me! And Batman tells him, Actually, that was a brain bomb. And he presses the button. Lobo's head explodes and Deadshot looks down, stating, Damn, Batman. Back below, Maxwell stands with Caitlyn in front of the giant vault, and he tells Caitlyn to destroy it. She begins freezing and blasting away at the doors until it's finally beginning to crumble. Superman leads the rest of the Justice League and the Suicide Squad down below, telling them that they have to hurry up and stop Maxwell Lord. But suddenly, all of the Justice League members begin to slow down, as Maxwell tells everyone to stop. Boomerang looks around and asks why is it that Maxwell's not trying to control anyone else? And Maxwell then says, why would I want to control a bunch of losers when I have the greatest powers in the universe? And now with the Eclipso Diamond, I can use the Justice League to save the world my way. You see, Maxwell Lord's ability is the power of suggestion through his voice. But with the Eclipso Diamond, he can now completely control anyone. And he just took control of the entire Justice League. Within minutes of Maxwell using the Eclipso Diamond, Flash dismantles all of the weapons of mass destruction around the entire world. Jessica and Simon create a barrier to protect the planet from invaders. And Aquaman secures the shore's borders. Wonder Woman places the US leaders under her protection. And Cyborg stops all communication around the entire world. So with all of that taken care of, the only place left for Maxwell Maxwell Lord to go is the White House. He begins to sit in the Oval Office, and he begins to feel a little bored with Superman standing there with him. He needs someone who will appreciate the peace that he's accomplished. Where's Amanda at? He asks. Back at Belle Reve, when it crumbled, Batman managed to stop the roof from caving in with a mesh shield, saving himself, Amanda, and Deadshot. Amanda tells him that the communications are down, so she has no idea if the diamond is secure. Batman tells her that his communications are also down, but the Justice League may have stopped Maxwell. Right now, they need to find a way out of this rubble. Suddenly, the ground begins to shake as the rocks are being lifted, and Batman tells Superman, thanks. And then he sees Superman's face. It's quite obviously not the normal Superman. Batman asks him how, and Superman says, I could hear your annoying voices from miles away, but I didn't come for you. I came for Amanda. Batman tells Amanda to stay back, and he prepares himself with his kryptonite ring. Superman grabs and throws Batman, stating, I no longer feel pain. Where I spent my whole life protecting one city and failing, Maxwell has saved the world within minutes. So everyone should know not to come after us. Superman shoots off holding Amanda, and Deadshot looks around. We are so screwed. That's when suddenly Lobo begins to jolt forward. Bastich! He turns to Batman. You blew me up! And Batman tells him it was the only way to break Maxwell's hold over him. So Lobo tells him, You know what? I like your style, Bat Freak. Let's go get Maxwell so I can frag him. As Lobo begins pulling away the debris, Rick and Katana walk up, stating that it's good to see them. Lucky for them, even though Belle Reeve is wrecked, the prisoners are contained. He goes on stating that Polaris and Rustum escaped, and currently the squad is dealing with one of Maxwell's new slaves. Suddenly, everyone begins to hear Caitlyn shout to keep him down. Cyborg is possessed. The squad then beats down on Cyborg, and Batman runs in telling everyone to stop. Cyborg isn't fighting against them. After backing everyone away, Batman holds Cyborg, and Cyborg tells him that his human side lost, but he created security protocols in case his human side was ever compromised. He goes on to explain that even with him somewhat there, Maxwell still has control, and there's something else speaking. Something with evil beyond anything that they've ever known. It's unlocking his darker impulses and making him want to act on them. Boomerang looks at him, not to look a gift horse in the mouth, but why don't we all look like that? Batman says that Maxwell Lord thinks they are nothing, that they don't have the power to stomp him. And he's right. Cyborg tells him Max won't be able to control the diamond for long. There's a darkness inside of him that is enjoying Maxwell's abilities. Batman asks if he can boom tube them to Maxwell Lord. And Cyborg says that it won't be exact, but he can at least get them over there. As Batman gets ready to go, Caitlyn says that she's going to because honestly, it's the end of the world. And even though her second life may be that of Killer Frost, she isn't going to let some purple rock take that away too. Lobo also says that he's going along. He has a bone to pick with Maxwell, and Boomerang says, Why not go along as well? He's sick of being treated like he isn't a threat, and he'll make Eclipse a regret not giving him a blue face. As the rest of the squad steps forward to go, Batman tells them that the odds are against them. All of them might not make it back. 
and Deadshot says, That's what we always do. How is this any different? We're the Suicide Squad. Batman tells him, This is different, because you're all going as the Justice League. Back at the White House, Maxwell Lord begins shouting, I did it! I did it! Isn't it wonderful, Amanda? He stands in the balcony telling her, Look, the world is finally free! Amanda looks out at the destruction with people fighting and killing, and then backhands Maxwell. She grabs him by the face, telling him that he needs to control himself. The diamond is in his head. What he's seeing isn't real. Look again. Maxwell looks out to see everyone fighting and says, No. Can feel the voice changing me. Down in the crowd, a loud boom goes off and Harley tells everyone, Don't you get handsy, you bunch of freaks! Everyone runs towards Amanda and a sudden blast stops them all from moving. Superman tells Batman, You didn't listen to me, and I'm glad you didn't. Back in the balcony, Maxwell begins to vomit up a black sludge and his skin begins to blister, while everyone on the ground begins to fight off the possessed Justice League. Caitlin asks, What happened to the sun? And Boomerang tells her, It's a sign that the dingo just ate our baby. A voice tells everyone, that it's been far too long since they felt the night's darkness. This world now belongs to Eclipso. As the people around the city begin to fight, Eclipso tells everyone that the darkness never leaves. It's always inside of them. He doesn't make people evil. He just unlocks the darkness within them. While the two groups clash, Deadshot focuses his fire directly onto Eclipso. And Eclipso grabs him by the neck, ripping his mask off, asking, Why do you cover your face from the world? Go ahead and show us what you're hiding. Deadshot's eyes begin to change, and he says... It's his daughter. She's the only thing keeping him human. And if he killed her, then he wouldn't feel shame or guilt anymore. Eclipso releases him, telling him, That's lovely. Now go find your way. Deadshot stands back up, his face changing, shouting that he will kill everyone. Eclipso flies up, grabbing Amanda Waller, telling her that her primitive sun lamps couldn't contain his presence. And now neither her nor the sun can hold him back. While Batman struggles with Wonder Woman, he hears Eclipso mentioning Amanda's methods of containment. Batman tells Caitlin that they need to blast him with light as bright as the sun. And just as Superman blasts away from Lobo, Batman says, There it is. He tells Caitlyn to create a prism to trap that blast and convert it into sunlight. Caitlyn says that she's pretty low on life force and it'll probably use up what she has. So if they really think this is it, they only have one shot at it. But as they walk away to get to cover, Harley tells them, It's a cry in shame that humanity's last hope is on you. Lobo charges in while Caitlyn starts to form up the prism. And while Lobo focuses on the group, Batman begins to taunt Superman, telling him, What you do, you'll never be human. Everyone knows it, even your son. Superman tells Batman to burn, and he fires his heat vision. And just before he can hit, Batman dodges as the blast goes in to Caitlyn's prism. The shine from the prism glares on everyone, including Eclipso. While everyone affected begins to awaken from their trance, Batman tells Caitlyn that she can't let it melt. As Caitlyn struggles to keep its shape, she says that it won't hold. She doesn't have enough power left. So Batman grabs onto her before she falls, telling her to take his life force. She says she can't. The amount she needs would kill him. And Batman says, I know. Do it. But before before she can, Superman's voice tells her, Take it from all of us. Boomerang tells her, Uh, women and children first. Caitlin begins to channel, and as she powers up, Eclipso blasts everyone, telling them, It won't be enough. He grabs onto Caitlyn and he tells her to show him what she wants that she can never admit. Her face begins to change as she says that she wants to make a difference. She reaches out, freezing Eclipso, and tells Superman, Now! He concentrates his heat vision into the prism, and the light begins to cover over Eclipso. As he shines, he screams in pain, and suddenly, from the light, Maxwell falls down. With everyone knocked down from the blast, Caitlyn says that they did it. And then from behind her, Amanda gets up telling her to kill him. Caitlyn staggers to get up and hesitates while Amanda continues shouting for her to kill him. As she reaches her hands out, Caitlyn tells her, no. She quits, and she falls over. A short while later, back at Belle Reeve, the squad and the Justice League regroup as everyone begins to ask each other questions about each other's teams. Boomerang asks Wonder Woman, So let me get this straight. I'd be the only man? And she tells him, There'd still be no men on it. And off to the side, Superman asks Caitlyn as she recovers and asks how she is. She tells him that Eclipso looked inside of her and he didn't find her fears. That wasn't what she was hiding. Superman says that Eclipso found hope inside of her. Caitlin goes on stating that maybe she should stay with the squad, and he tells her that what she did wasn't suicide, it was sacrifice. Elsewhere, Batman tells Amanda that Caitlin is coming with them. Since they are promised reduced sentences, she will come with him due to the fact that she showed the League great potential. And as much as he hates to admit it, Caitlin also showed that there is some value in Task Force X. So there may be in fact room for both teams. Amanda smiles, asking if he's really stating that he may actually be wrong. But he can have Caitlyn. But remember, she will be back working for her. Just wait and see. As Batman gets ready to leave, he sees Lobo and he tells him, We need to talk. 
Lobo reaches into his vest, getting ready to come at Batman, and as he gets closer, he takes out a match and he lights it off Batman's chest plate. He tells him that he did him a favor by freeing him from Maxwell, so if he ever needs a job done, no matter how messy, give him a call. As Lobo lights a cigar, he walks away, and Batman tells him, I already have a job for you. I want you to join the Justice League. Later, Maxwell begins to wake up asking, how did I get here? And he thinks back, and he begins to go over everything that happened. How he discovered the existence of the Diamond and Checkmate. He needed a team to retrieve it. The Justice League distracted the squad while he freed the prisoners. This is all one very long plan that he followed each and every step for exactly. And it was all set up by you, Amanda Waller. Maxwell goes on telling Amanda that she is the one who tipped him off. She set this whole thing in motion because Batman was going to come after the squad and together they saw a common enemy, him. And even though they captured Maxwell, they still have some loose ends out there, like where are the first members who managed to escape? And then Maxwell asks, was it all worth it? And Amanda tells him, she doesn't have to answer to him. And if he notices, those tubes are hooked up with full grade blood thinners. So if he tries to use his powers, he'll bleed out before he can even exit the building. Maxwell then asks if this is where she's going to welcome him to Task Force X. And she tells him no. She has other plans for him. He would be wasted with them, but he would be perfect for Task Force 11. Just outside the outskirts of Metropolis, Clark flies through the Infinity Corporation to meet with Bruce, and he asks him what this is all about. Bruce tells him, it's the end of the world, isn't it always? Just then, a bright white light begins to spread surrounding the entire city, and Superman says, I need to go back and get John and Lois. But Batman tells him, they're not dead. They're already gone, but we can bring them back. We can save everyone. Trust me. As the light spreads, everything begins to disappear except for the Infinity Corporation building. During the State of Fear events, the Justice League was controlled by their overwhelming fears of the world, and they began to to act out in ways that they wouldn't normally do. With everyone fighting their own demons, Arthur and Diana announced that they would take control of the world so that everyone could be safe. But now, as some of the Justice League walks into the United Nations, Arthur says that he's a little nervous about this. Jessica tells him that they're here to reassure the world that after what happened, they are still safe from them. Flash says that he can now see why Batman likes to take precautions with these sort of things. But before they can get into the meeting room, a young girl runs up shouting, they're coming! They have to help! Cyborg asks who, and the girl points at the massive army of men yelling, them! The two lanterns quickly begin to build up shields. However, the army seemingly is just able to push through their constructs. Diana tells Flash to get the girl out of here, and Flash grabs her and begins to feel himself slow down. As Flash asks what's going on, the young girl tells him it's a temporal grenade, and one of the soldiers punches the Flash in the back. The Flash and the girl skid off to the side, and then the Flash asks, what the heck is going on? And the girl tells him that those guys are trying to stop her from saving the world. She starts to pull out several wrist devices from her bag, and she says that she shouldn't be doing any of this because she isn't allowed to interfere. Just watch them all screw up the universe. The girl gets back up explaining that these beings are called the Timeless. They're a sort of religious movement who believe that the powers that you have shouldn't exist on Earth. The girl starts to put one of the devices onto the Flash's wrist and she goes on stating that the Timeless are here to put an end to superheroes. People with powers, that kind of stuff. They believe that the superheroes pollute the natural direction that life should take. And the Flash says, okay, so who are you? And the girl says that her name is Molly. She is the Keeper. She's been watching them ever since they were apes coming out of the trees. Flash tells her, right, you look human. And Molly says, so? Superman does as well. Back over at the Infinity Corporation building, Batman tells Superman that he would like him to meet Vincent, Alexis, and Jane of the Infinity Corporation. Superman says, I know who you are and what these stones seem to do. Where are my wife and son? Vincent says, something is rewriting the past, maybe the future. Things are being changed and they have no idea as to why or how. Superman turns to Batman. You said I could save Lois and John. Do you trust them? And Batman looks at him and says, I don't trust many people, but I believe them. That good enough? Superman then asks, what do we do now. And Jade says they're going to have to ride this wave out and see where they end up. As the light begins to fade, the Justice League members at the UN find themselves in a barren land. And Molly asks if they're all okay. Flash says that she needed them for what? And Molly points to the large compound, telling them all that she needs their help destroying that. She goes on to say that she's going to keep things simple. That thing is sort of a temporal bomb. The Timeless detonated it five minutes ago. It exists at certain key points in the past and the future. There are six total throughout the entire time stream. And when they go off, things change. There there isn't going to be any more powers or heroes, universe altering, reality shifting stuff. Flash asks, how can I trust you? And Molly tells him that she's watched them all fight impossible odds. So they can either do something or stand there and cease to exist in like two minutes. The light begins to shine and Molly says, 
Look, those devices on your wrist, they'll take you to the key points where the devices are. Use them to destroy the cores in those buildings. Back at the Infinity Building, Batman asks, where are we now? And Jane says, the better question is when. Superman looks out the window to see that they are in space, and one of those buildings that Molly spoke of is covering the entire Earth. Superman touches the window asking, where are my wife and son? But over in Atlantis, 47,000 years in the past, Arthur Curry, Aquaman, stands prisoner as the king asks him, who are you? Our spell of translation and truth has been cast, so if you lie, you will be burned. So Arthur tells them. I've been sent from the far future to save the world from a force that will change history. In my time, I'm the king of Atlantis, so cast your spells, you will not burn me. The queen says, that is quite the statement. And the king says, he isn't burning. He speaks truthfully. Arthur is released, and as he gets back up, he sees the Zodiac crystals, and he says that he used these to stop the world from falling apart. He can hear them singing. The king tells him that the song is only meant for the hearts of the royal family of Atlantis. You have our ears, so tell me why you're here. Meanwhile, 500 years from the current time, the Earth core surrounds Jessica and Simon telling them that they are under arrest and they will surrender all weaponry to them. Another laughs telling them, you're trying to impersonate Green Lanterns. <laughs> what a joke. Simon asks Jessica if she's ready and she smiles telling him, right now? Yeah. They punch down on the Earth creating a massive green explosion and they tell the Earth Corps that they are Green Lanterns from Earth Sector 2814. Now you're going to get up and take us to whoever's in charge. A short while later, the Earth Corps takes Jessica and Simon to their power battery and one of the members says that this is their precinct, the first of its kind. Simon asks, what is it doing here? Do the Guardians know you have the power battery? And another says, they don't care, so we built it. Our world is in chaos. The power plagues broke everything down, and the world has been quarantined so that they wouldn't infect any other world. There was one Green Lantern who chose to stay behind and be our light in the darkness. And one of the girls asks if they've come to help with the quarantine, and Jessica says, she's not sure. That's when an image of Molly pops on the device and says, looks like everyone made it okay. The message is played to everyone across time and space, and she explains that what they seek will normally not be seen. The device that she gave them will make it visible though. They need to get inside of the temporal core, put the device into it, and it'll detonate. The key points in time were an ancient dry Atlantis where magic was at its peak in Greece when the time of the Olympians began. When Barry Allen became the Flash and created the Speed Force, the power plagues of the 26th century and finally the 30th century when the powers of the other worlds found a home on Earth. The timeless want to change and erase things, reroute historical events to make things seem like they've never happened. You are alone in the world's only chance. The cyborg says, well, that's not good. As all the devices light up, everyone in their various time periods begin to see the timeless buildings appear over them. Over in the Infinity Building, Superman looks back asking, what happened to my wife and son? And Vincent tells him plainly he doesn't know. Jane explains that a vast amount of time has been altered, and because of that, you didn't come to this Earth. We're unsure how this is affecting you or us. As everyone prepares for the wave front to reach them, Superman says that he's going to go out there and talk to whoever that is and ask about his family. Batman stops him, telling him, what are you planning on doing? And Clark tells him, I'm going to be direct. He flies out of the space station and he sees the army of timeless waiting for him. He tells them, I've come here to talk. If you want a fight, I can give you one, though I wouldn't recommend it. The timeless stand down and a voice says, I am everywhere. I have been waiting for you. It is time for us to save history. And Superman sees a giant creature in the heart of the station. As he floats, Clark directly asks, where are my wife and son? The being asks, are you willing to tear down the walls of reality to find them? How many universes will you cross to reach them? And Superman tells him, as many as it takes. There are my whole world, not Krypton, not Earth, them. The being then says, my name is Tempest, the timeless mind. My consciousness stretches from one end of time to the other. The universe pivots around you and your friends. Something that doesn't belong here is forcing its way in and that will be the end of the universe. There is another of you, another Superman. But now, I cannot fully read that echo or future. He is an anomaly, unknown. Superman tells him, I'm going to ask you nicely one last time. Where is my family? And Tempest tells him, they are where you left them. In a moment of time, Superman begins to pull his arm back and as he does, all of the timeless begin to fly up around him. They grab a hold of Superman and Tempest says, I have filtered the solar radiation in here to red, enough to make you more cooperative. Superman struggles to free himself, asking, what do you want? And Tempest tells him, I want what you all want, to save everything. Across time, the heroes are facing the time's greatest challenges, just as the timeless begin to attack and harness the energy from each time period. In Greece, the time of the Titans, Cronus sought to eat his children and gain power, while his wife Rhea and his son Zeus fought him back. Diana watches as she remembers the story from when she was a child with her mother. She didn't think that she would ever actually be a part of it. In Central City, Barry Allen is watching at the exact moment that he was struck with lightning, the moment that he should have died, but instead became the Flash. In ancient Greece, when the Atlanteans had magical power greater than the world knew, Arthur Curry stood, in the power battery of the 26th century Washington, D.C., and finally, the 30th century Metropolis. Back with Superman, Tempest tells him that everyone will be safe from your world. I have witnessed all that is and all that will be, and you cannot fully see the danger that threatens you. It is beyond malice, beyond darkness. It will consume everything. So I have taken steps 
steps to prevent that. A network of devices throughout time powered by magic, the green light, the gods and speed focused from the future and back into the history. Reality seems to pivot around Earth and those who protect it, and it is there that this destruction will spill into the universe. I am going to move Earth. These machines will lift the Earth's entire solar system from its point in time and take it to the ends of creation. You may live, you may not, but all else in the universe will be safe from your perils. Superman says that that woman Molly sent my friends to those machines. She sent them there to stop you. And Tempest begins to look through time and begins to feel them, and he starts to feel each of them fighting his timeless soldiers. After a few moments, he says, I have located your friends. They will not succeed. The energy wave is growing, and the Earth system is being isolated from space-time. Once it's past, the future will be fully captured, and we will move to the end of forever. The universe will be safe from you at last. Back in Infinity, Batman is watching and asking, what do we do? And Vincent says that the stones are telling them that they will be able to counter the temporal field, but they need to find the center of it all. And Bruce says, fine, I'm gonna go with Superman. And then he looks to Jane, since you've already handled Rao, can you come with me? She tells him that she thought he'd never ask, and Alexa says that come with her, she's got something. She goes on stating that they're going to need a bit of advantage. This might help. It belonged to her father. And then she opens up a door, and inside is Lex Luthor's Superman suit. As Batman suits up into the Superman suit created by Lex Luthor, he asks, Alexis, so you're Lex's daughter? And she says that she will be, sort of. Batman then says, I can tell that you're obviously time travelers, but we've never talked about the specific connections to our present. And Vincent tells him, we don't have the time either. It's more complicated than one thing. Once Batman and Jane head out, Vincent and Alexis try to locate the center of the temporal nexus. When Alexis looks at the screen, it says that she doesn't know what she's looking at. And Vincent says that she wouldn't know without scanning his brain right now. Alexis then asks, what is that supposed to mean? And Vincent tells her that what he is saying is that that thing Tempest is sort of like him, like his father. Bruce radios back into their position. Begin countdown. Vincent begins counting down from 10. And Batman and Jane begin pushing on the walls of one of the pillars. As it comes crashing down into the room with Superman, shining light goes in and it begins to return Superman's powers. He flies up asking, now where are Lois and John? And Batman tells him, we're gonna get to them, I promise. Superman reaches down to the pillar and says, yes, we will. He then takes the giant pillar and begins to drag it through the walls of the inside. And as he does that, he says, even though the red sun radiation kept my strength from recharging, I can still tell that there is something different. Tempest was a hologram, meaning that Tempest's mind may have been virtual. And if this needs any kind of machinery, Batman tells him, I got it. The center of Tempest's creation begins to explode and throughout time, the timeless soldiers begin falling. Now, with a clear path, each of the heroes begins to reach the temporal cores. Back in the current time, Molly shouts that they did it. The big, beautiful heroes did it. All of the powers of magic, God, speed, light, colors, all of it are passing through her. It is time to do what Tempest wouldn't do and make the world safe throughout time. As the power surges through Molly, she then says, or it will be once every superhero and villain on this world is dead. Over in the Infinity Building, Vincent reports that they need to get to the surface. There is a massive surge of new energy and they're going to deal with Tempest. Superman leads the charge back to Earth and he tells him, I'm already on my way there. As he comes crashing down, he looks at Molly and he asks, who are you and why? Why do you keep doing this? And Molly says, I told everyone to call me Molly, but it's too late for them to stop me. I've gained the power to control energy in the timeless machines. Your time here is over, and I'm going to give this world its best chance of survival by wiping out every being with superpowers. Superman asks her, why? And Molly goes on to tell him, you're a plague. I've been the keeper here since the humans evolved. On other worlds, if powers arise, they've aided with evolution or survival, but here it is different. The gods have come. Magic was birthed. The speed force is created. And soon we will see what the guardians did and they will capture the green light. Other worlds and powers have come here by the Legion. In the end, it will mean the death for everyone here and maybe everywhere else. The Timeless are right. Something is coming and it's because of you. Humanity needs to survive. You don't. Molly releases a massive energy blast and as Superman tries to hold it back, he says, I can't do it for long. There's magic in it. We need something. He turns back telling Batman, I'm trusting you with everything that matters to me. Find my family. And Batman tells him, you have my word. They will be safe, both of them. Superman looks over at Jane and she tells him, I'm staying. My father fought by your side. Well, Superman's side. He was the greatest man that I ever knew. Just then, Superman pushes Molly back with a devastating heat vision beam, allowing Batman to escape. Batman asks the suit to scan for John, and it responds stating that a human Kryptonian hybrid has been found. Meanwhile, over at the Infinity Building, Alexis brings the building close to Tempest's center, and she asks Vincent if he's sure about this. He flies down to the controls, and he says, I know. And then he cuts into his wrist, letting his blood spill into the machine. At that moment, the heroes across time begin to link together in communication, and to all of them, Tempest tells them that they have been lied to. The Keeper Molly manipulated you, and with your help, she has taken the power of the machines and intends to use it to render you and those like you extinct. But as Tempest talks, Vincent's face pushes through Tempest, and he asks, Can anyone hear me? Everyone responds, and Vincent tells him, Look, I've bled into the timeless systems. I can't stay for long, but I need you all to do something so that you can save the world. You need to destroy the cores, all of them, whatever it takes. And Simon says, Wait, if we do that, wouldn't we be stranded?
stranded in these times? And Vincent says, yes, probably. I'm sorry. Cyborg tells him, don't be. We'll do what we need to do. Tempest fights back for control and he shouts for Vincent to get out. You can't stop this. I won't allow it. Back to Superman and Jane. Superman picks himself up as Jane lays past out. Superman hurries back over to help Jane and Molly tells him, the superheroes had their time. It is time for you all to die so the world can be safe. And Superman tells her, it won't be that easy. I'm asking, giving you a chance to stop this. And Molly shouts, I'll only stop when the world is wiped clean of your disease. Suddenly Molly's powers begin to fade and she yells, no! They've destroyed the connections. And Superman laughs and groans, stating, ah, I can always count on my friends. She gathers up whatever strength she has left and says that there's more than enough in this machine to finish him. Superman gets back up and he flies to the machine's core. And as he begins to blast away, Molly shouts for him to stop. Stop or she will call with his son. But while that happens, Vincent lays on the machines and the Tempest tells him that if Earth remains, it will come. It will destroy the universe. Vincent looks up and tells him, I know. I'm counting on it. Boom. Just then, Tempest's virtual mind is destroyed and Vincent watches as he fades to nothing. Over on the outskirts of Metropolis, the Timeless falls to their knees and Lois asks John, did you do something? John tells her, no, maybe I should fly them out of here. But before they can leave, Molly crashes down telling Superman, I know you can hear me. I will kill your son unless you stand down. I will kill them both. However, Superman does hear her words and he doesn't stop destroying the machine's core. As she releases another energy wave, Batman jumps down to shield them, but the suit is badly damaged. She asks, what was that? Was that all the resistance that you have? And right on cue, Diana, along with the other Justice League members, tell her, not at all. After Superman is done taking down the core, he flies over to hug his family and he asks Batman if he's okay. He leans up telling him, I'll live. And Flash tells them, we all will. And Molly yells, it's coming. We don't know what it is, but we can all feel it. All of the higher beings can. It's coming here because of you. And when it does, you will wish that you had gone with the Reapers. You'll wish that I had finished what I had started. Flash tries to talk, but Molly interrupts him, telling him, you did this. Now it can't be stopped. It begins in the ruins of Queens, New York, as Barry Allen begs for the dying Jessica Cruz to stay with him. As she draws her final breath, a voice shouts to him asking, why should he live when she didn't? Barry looks up shouting, what the hell are you talking about? She's dead, dead because of you. The man takes his device and he slams it into the ground so the Flash runs up touching it and everything changes. Suddenly, Barry is in a diner with Jessica and he tells her that he ordered her usual three times actually. He ate the first two while waiting. So she missed the big fight last night, huh? She laughs telling him, yeah. She got held up fighting this guy who can make living shadows. He should have totally seen it. He was so bad. But while the two enjoy their breakfast, there's an explosion that rips through the diner. A voice calls out that he's going to tear them apart. All of them! And they're going to pay for what they've done. Barry and Jessica suit up as the Green Lantern and the Flash. And as Jessica asks who is this guy, the Flash says that he's not sure, but he remembers something about him. She charges up her ring telling the guy that she's not sure what he's talking about, but they're the good guys. They save people, and the man jumps into the air with his device yelling that they aren't heroes. Because of them, his family is dead. He comes back down using the device to stab into Jessica, creating another explosion. She falls back to the ground, and the Flash runs over telling her to stay with them. She tells him that she's sorry. She's so sorry. Just like before, the Flash watches Jessica die again, and the man shouts asking, Why should you live when she didn't? Why?! The Flash gets up and he runs at the man telling him that she's dead, dead because of him. And as he touches the device, everything changes again. Except now, Barry is moments after meeting up with Jessica. She grabs his arm, stating that she figured that he would already be at the diner eating her breakfast right about now. And Barry says that he was, or did, what's going on? The two begin to walk towards the diner and Barry says that they've done this before. The man from before shows up, but this time it is before the two of them even enter the diner. Jessica turns back telling Barry to get back, but instead of letting her go first, he rushes towards the man and everything changes. He hangs up his phone after calling Jessica, and as he does, the man from before appears and attacks. The events continue to replay themselves over and over, each time with slight differences. There's one thing that Barry Allen does notice though, and that there's a building that has the same type of energy coming out of it. It's the same type of energy as the alien that they fought in Brooklyn. And the Flash runs inside of the destroyed building, finding the same man sitting there asking him, what did you do? The Flash tells him, wait, I didn't do anything. And the man shouts, they're all dead. You killed them. This is justice. And he slams the device down once more. But this time the Flash runs and touches it and he goes further back in time, back to when they defeated the alien. He stumbles out of the time jump and Batman asks if he's okay. And the Flash tells him, no, 
There was an explosion. Superman says he didn't hear one, and the Flash tells him it hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen soon. He's been having a sort of time travel Groundhog Day kind of thing. If they don't stop what's about to happen, then the guy's going to kill Jessica. Simon powers up his ring, stating that Jessica can't be dead. He would have known if something like that happened. And the Flash tells everyone, look, it hasn't happened yet. All I know is that there is this facility nearby that's going to blow up, and we have to stop him. Meanwhile, over at that facility, Jason Taylor meets with his wife Rose and their children just before Jason's big reveal. He asks Rose why she didn't get a sitter, and she says that Tony's wife offered, but she didn't feel comfortable with, well, you know. So Tony said that she could bring the kids. Jason sets his son down, stating he's so glad that they're here. He's just nervous right now. Rose tells him it's fine. He's amazing. And that's when Jason's boss Tony says that this is what they call him. Mr. Amazing, it is time for them to change the world. Jason says, yeah, about that, can we talk in private for a moment? A short while later in the presentation hall, Jason explains to the people that they've discovered how to harness zero-point energy into a single device. This device will allow them to control gravity and forces beyond them. It will revolutionize the military and their industry. Zero fuel costs for air travel. This device will take them to the stars. And just as Jason reaches for the device, the Justice League appears before him. Superman tells everyone, please, back away. We have it on good authority that this weapon of mass destruction will devastate the area. And Jason walks up to them, stating, wait, my device is safe. You can't do this. The Flash gets close to the device, and Cyborg says that he's getting an energy spike. The speed force is, and then an explosion goes off, destroying everything within the blast radius. Jason picks himself back up, stating that he's got to find them. Oh God, Rose, they can't be dead. And Diana starts to get up asking what happened. And the Flash says that he thinks that they caused it. That they are the reason for all of this. The Justice League killed his family. Jason grabs the device once more, shouting, Why do you get to live when my family didn't? That's not justice! And before the Flash can stop him, Jason slams the device down again. As the light fades, we see Jason and Rose in their kitchen. And Jason says, I'm not the bad guy here. And Rose tells him, she's not saying that he is, but they've had this trip booked for two months. It's supposed to be their fresh beginning. Jason goes back to tying his tie and he says, you know, I got a call from Tony 10 minutes ago. They brought the project forward a month. They think that we're ready. Rose helps with Jason's tie and she asks, I don't suppose that you could have said no, huh? Jason then asks, why would I? This is a massive government contract. It could be worth billions. This is my project and my design. This could make our lives better. And Rose asks, is Tony going to be there as well? And Jason says, well, he is my boss. Rose gives Jason a kiss and tells him to go change the world. Jason says the world wouldn't be worth changing without her in it. Elsewhere, as the Flash opens up his eyes, he sees them fighting the alien from before. As he gets up, Batman asks, Hey, is everything okay? You took quite a hit back there. The Flash rubs his head, telling him no. No, why am I here again? This is before. Maybe we could stop it. Change it before Jessica. And Batman asks, What do you mean? Save who? What are you talking about? While everyone begins to fight, the Flash gives Batman the rundown of what's been happening with the time jumps, and then the man that appears and the destruction that follows. The Flash says that he knows this all sounds crazy, and Batman tells him, not for us. Everyone should be able to handle themselves here. Let's go, Barry. A short while later, over at the facility, Batman says the weapon should be guarded, so they need to keep it from being triggered again to cause another event. As Batman begins to head in, the Flash makes a quick call to Jessica, and she tells him that she's a little busy at the moment. Flash tells her, yeah, can you, uh, just call me back whenever. And as he hangs up, he says, okay, now I'm ready. The two sneak into the guard room, and as Batman begins to put on a uniform, he says that he's going to stay close to the weapon and its designer. Once they have Cyborg tapped in, they're going to have him look through all of the relevant files on the weapon. Batman then heads into the halls, and the Flash radios back that he just took a long look through some of the files, and they state that they're looking for Jason Taylor. He should be the one not in a suit. Batman spots him, and just at that moment, Tony comes to check on everything. Back with the other, Cyborg receives the message from the Flash to tap into the systems, and he says to give him just a moment while he's accessing their location. Over with Jason and Tony, Tony asks what's going on. He's going to be going on in five minutes, and Jason tells him that he knows about him and Rose. She told him everything. Tony tries to deny it at first, and then he says that if she did, then she must have told him that it's over. Are you going to be okay? Jason tells him no, he's not okay. He hates everything, and he hates it more because it was with him. But him and Rose are working through it. They want to. Tony tells him that she's the one who broke it off. It was only a couple of times and but Jason stops him, telling him, I don't want to hear it. After today, it won't matter. I've spoken with the general and he's agreed that if today goes well, I'll be getting my own department. And so when that happens, we're going to see how your department holds out. Batman asks the Flash if he got all of that. And he tells him yes, and Cyborg just got done scanning the system. Turns out most of the work emails have been deleted and are unrecoverable, but they did find one that was sent out about 10 minutes ago. All it said was the package will be delivered today, whatever that means. Back with the alien, everyone gets ready to move out of the facility, but Diana sees Aquaman just standing there. She asks, what is it? And Aquaman looks at the alien and says, now that it's quiet, I can sort of feel it. 
Panic. Fear. Like it's dying. Diana tells him that he's right. She can see the truth in it. Perhaps there's more to learn about this being. Cyborg then radios back that he just took a look at the files on the device and it turns out that it was built on alien tech. What's more, someone copied and transferred the files earlier. Someone named Tony Palmer. Back in the showroom, Jason begins his presentation when Batman walks up to him telling him that they have it on an impeccable authority that his device will go off and kill nearly everyone here. Jason asks him, what are you talking about? Let me check the... Oh God, it's on a build-up cycle, an energy pulse, one that could destroy the whole facility. Batman radios back to Flash to go ahead and prep an evac, and Jason says he can't stop it. It needs a higher authorization code. Batman says, Palmer. And Jason asks, Tony, why would he? Batman explains that it has been industrial espionage. He's been copying the device's specs, possibly to sell them. Jason says that there's no way that he would do anything like that. This device is one of a kind, built on an alien energy source. And Batman asks, what happens when the device goes off? And Jason tells him that the facility will be destroyed, but the device will remain untouched. Batman then says that he overheard his conversation with Tony about the affair. Tony asked for his family to be here. He's going to blow the place up with all of them in it. And Jason asks, what can we do? Seconds later, Cyborg boom tubes the rest of the team in there. The Flash finishes getting the last person out of the building and the device begins to become unstable. Superman tells everyone not to worry. I'm gonna take it up into space and... But before he can grab it, the device shocks him to the ground. Simon tries to contain it, but the device's effects just repel his green energy. Just as everyone tries to figure out what they can do, the alien from before crashes down, grabbing the device. Superman shouts, we need to stop that alien. And Diana tells him, wait, let it go. Aquaman says that he can feel it properly now. The device and the alien, it's harmony. They're two parts of the same being. Once the device is absorbed, the alien speaks, stating that his star heart has been returned. He goes on telling everyone that he is sorry for the attack. Without his star heart, all reasoning is gone. His name is Sentry, and they guard the Darklands border and prevent incursions. The star heart was sent to investigate the Kindred's signal. However, he must go. They must guard their own borders. It is upon them. Later, as everyone sits down for dinner, Jessica asks, Wait, I died? And Barry tells her, twice actually. We got it all sorted out though. Cyborg explains to the alien, that was a warning. And Batman says, it's not the first, is it? Ever since the Kindred, we've had other beings. The Fear Thing, Molly, the Timeless, the Sentry, all of them warning us about something. Something is coming. We all need to get ready for whatever it is. Up in the Justice League Watchtower in space, Cyborg calls the team in for an emergency. He's picking up a monumental power spike in the Atlantic, to be specific. A superstorm on a non-terrestrial scale. But before he could even say exactly where it is, Superman already knows. Atlantis. As the team goes back down to Earth, they find a giant hole in the ocean revealing Atlantis is surrounded by a protective dome. Cyborg scans the field and says that this isn't anything that he's ever seen before. The reading shows that it is unbreakable. A void look comes over Diana's face as she says that this seems to be the work of magic. And Simon and Jessica also scan a report that what's going on down there is also creating massive tidal waves, and they are heading straight for the U.S. coastline. Cyborg boom tubes everyone to the coast and the team gets to work softening the waves, but there's a voice coming up from deep within. Mera appears out of the water asking, what do you think you're doing? You are not to interfere. As everyone gets close, Jessica asks if she is the one doing this. And Cyborg tells her, your aqua kinetics would explain it, but I had no idea that you were this powerful, Mera. Mera shouts again, telling everyone, go away. Do not try and stop me. Arthur was cast down as a king and I am now being kept from him by the crown of thorns. If you're curious about that plot line, that is where our Aquaman stories are leading and we will be getting to it soon. So click the link down below to find the Aquaman playlist and keep up with that. For days, she's been driving the ocean itself against the barrier, but it will not break. Diana tries to tell her to calm down, let them help and but before Diana could even finish, Mera screams, no, and blasts both her and Superman away and then traps them within two water bubbles. Simon and Jessica fly in to try and help, but Mera asks them, how would you fare without your jewelry? Water begins to flow towards the two lanterns and then easily washes over them, pulling off their rings. The Flash runs in stating, you may have taken out four of our heavy hitters, but you're no match for my... And Mera says, no, I can't match your speed, but you're going to find it hard to move when you're entirely dehydrated. After sucking all of the water out of Flash, Cyborg jumps out of the water stating, that's enough. A large spire of water shoots up, throwing Cyborg away, and Mera tells him, I completely agree. Mera then shouts that they should just get the message by now. Leave her alone! Batman swims up from behind, leaping out of the water, holding a trank gun. But as Mera spins back, grabbing him by the throat, she asks, Really? I know all about your playbook on everyone, and you don't have one on me. You don't even know me. None of you do! 
as she begins to choke Batman, he pulls out a small hypersonic scream and says, I'm sorry, but this is gonna hurt. The sound waves stun Mera long enough for her powers to fade, and she yells, I told you to stay back! If you assault Atlantis, you're gonna fail just as I have, and such an act by the surface dwellers will provoke a war. That is the last thing that Arthur would have wanted. Superman tells her that her assault nearly washed away the east coast of the US. Would Arthur have wanted that? She falls to her knees, stating that she wasn't thinking straight. Peace with the surface would have been all that Arthur wanted. He fought for it. It cost him his throne. And Superman says, You're just lashing out because you had nowhere for your anger to go. And Mara asks, Who should I vent to? I know no one on the surface. Diana tells her that that is how it was for Arthur in the beginning. He didn't trust us from the start. And Superman says, Please, let us help. Batman walks up, stating that he suggests that they take her back to the Watchtower. And Mara asks, why? To replace Arthur? You're supposed to be his friends. And Diana kneels down with Mara, telling her, and we will make you our friend as well. A short while later, up in space, Mara explains that she really has no identity, either in the ocean or on the surface. Her birthplace, Zebel, considers her a pariah, and Atlantis has only ever been her adopted home. As ashamed as she is to feel it, she was a bit excited when Arthur lost the throne. Perhaps then, they could have had an actual life together, freed from the burdens of the Atlantean politics. Batman then asks, when was it that Arthur taught you how to take us down so effectively? You were playing off of our strengths and weaknesses. And Mara says, actually, he didn't. I was only bluffing, putting you all off your game. But I just made everything worse, didn't I? My fury against Atlantis has... Diana stops her, telling her, Allow me to show you something. And the two walk to the glass window. Diana says that up here they can see everything, surface and ocean alike. One world, one home. It lives or it dies together. Mara asks, where is it that she belongs in that? And Superman tells her, we were all outsiders to begin with. Every one of us. This is where we came together. The planet is what keeps us together. Simon flies into the room and says that he's sorry to break in, but it looks like the Kowardian hate drones just deployed over Pakistan. So Diana tells him that they're coming with. And Batman says that maybe Mara should join them. Mara smiles and leaves with the team, but Simon asks Batman, is that really a good idea? You saw what she did. She was exhausted after days of effort and not even using her full strength. And Batman tells him, exactly. Now imagine what she could do with us. In the ruins of New York City, a group of six children, all wearing the clothing of heroes past, prepare to make their final stand against the person who brought this destruction, Sovereign. As they prepare to move, the leader hunter asks if there's any signs of curry, and Cube tells him that he scanned the area and he couldn't detect anyone cloaked. From the waters, the girl Serenity jumps up to the ledge, telling Hunter that he better be right. Tempest's forces will overrun Atlantis now that she is gone, and Cruz tells her that they all know what's at stake here. There's no way to go back if they do this. Hunter looks out of the darkness, stating that it's spreading. They have to stop this no matter what. And the six put their hands together, stating that they will do this because they are family. Just then a boom tube opens up and Arthur Curry jumps out, shouting for everyone to get away. Cube stumbles back, stating that it's like seeing a ghost wearing his father's corpse. Cruz says that she will handle this, and as she runs up, Arthur Curry Curry releases a temporal grenade slowing her down, slamming her to the ground. Hunter then lunges in, but as he misses, Arthur Curry punches him in the gut, telling him, You are in over your heads. You have to stop this before I have to kill you. Before Arthur can attack again, the twins, Jenny and Jason, use their red and yellow lantern lights to hold Arthur in place long enough for everyone to get back up. They then notice that Arthur is wearing a dark ring, and that everything around them begins to fade to black. Serenity is using her magic to distort the darkness and quickly teleports everyone across the globe to their target location. After checking on everything, Hunter says they need to hurry. They made a lot of noise and Sovereign will be coming for them. The group presses on towards the destroyed Infinity Core building, and Cube says that he can hear them singing. They're almost there. Once inside, Cube taps into the computer system, stating that he can hear them, though it's a bit faint. Seconds later, a screen lights up and Vincent appears, telling everyone that it looks like they got his message. They're all grown up now. The stones know what to do. Take you where you need to go. Save us. Just as the distorted video ends, Sovereign herself appears in a fiery blaze, shouting, You should should not have come here. Serenity tries to hold her back, telling the others that they need to hurry and do whatever it is that will make those stones sing again. And Sovereign jumps through the magic, stating that she has claimed the powers of Olympus and exiled her former gods. Who are you to stand against me? Serenity yells back that she is Eldorus Curry, Queen of Atlantis, and to that, she is no pushover. Moments after Hunter joins the fight, a bright light shines as a portal opens up and Cube yells that it's now or never. And one by one, the children escape. The present day Midway City, the Justice League look over the recent battle that has left the city mostly destroyed. Cyborg scans one of the people stating that it's the same pattern as before. These people were given significantly enhanced strength and they fought each other. Diana says that she has seen this too often. Religion, politics, pursuit of power. She left her home to stop this and every day she has failed. They have 
have to stop this. Cyborg tells her that he's pretty sure they can't impose their will on the world. It would make them no better than the villains that they fight. And just then a ring of light appears before the group and suddenly the six children from before fall out. Diana draws her sword asking, who are you? And Cruz jumps up stating that they are their children from the future. Their world is destroyed and it's all their fault. Later at the watchtower, Cyborg tells everyone to sit tight. He's going to run a deep tissue analysis to figure this all out. And Diana asks, how can they claim to be their children? She doesn't remember giving birth. Hunter tells her that it's because it all happens 22 years from now. While Mara meets her daughter Serenity, Jessica Cruz and Barry Allen learn that they actually have three children. Barry says, wait, I had three kids with Jessica, not Iris? Cruz tells him that her name is actually Nora, Nora Allen, named after grandma. That should mean something, right? But while everyone talks, Clark quietly asks Diana what's wrong. She hasn't said anything. She spitefully points to Hunter, stating that there's something about him. Is she his mother? Hunter snaps back that he knew that she would be like this. He's not sure why he even expected anything different. Diana asks, why are you so angry? What have I done to you? And Hunter yells, nothing, absolutely nothing. You took one look at me and abandoned me the minute that I was born, all because I wasn't a girl. Not an Amazon like you. He grabs onto the lasso, telling her, if you don't believe me go ahead and use this face the truth she turns away telling him that he's not lying he is telling the truth and as the results come back cyborg says of the readings back up what they are stating there definitely are their children which means cube here is his son simon then says that he doesn't want to sound weird or anything but aren't any of them well his jason tells him no actually he ends up leading the yellow lanterns after he kills sinestra superman says that he supposes they have to believe them but now that they know who they are why are they here cube tells cyborg that it might be a bit quicker if they just sync up their information over the last 20 years as the to connect, Cyborg sees the last 20 years in an instant, and he says that he has to tell them, show them what happened. Projected images begin to appear, and Cube says that they all grew up together, and just as they were coming of age, there was a war. A superhuman war. It was the most brutal war the world has ever seen, unleashed by a darkness that nobody has ever felt before that. They were all hidden away in Olympus, told that this was only going to be for a little while, but no one ever came back for them. Serenity eventually claimed her throne in Atlantis, while everyone else tried to bring hope back to the world. And that's when Sovereign appeared and took Olympus. Even though it was Sovereign, Sovereign's world, it may as well have been Apocalypse. So using the last Forever Stones and Vincent's help, they came here to find them. Jessica hugs her children, stating that that's no life for any child. As Superman tells everyone that there will be enough time to talk, I'm pretty sure you're all tired and hungry. While everyone begins to go their separate ways, Diana is left alone, angry. Meanwhile, down in the Batcave, Batman continues his research on the Kindred and the song that they left behind. As Cyborg said before, there is a pattern, a signal causing all of this to happen. If you're curious about that, that's the entire Justice League DC Rebirth playlist. All of that leads to this. The computer system Genie says that she has received Cyborg's data from Midway City, and it would seem that the signals are all still transmitting. Batman tells her to go ahead and forward all of the information that he just found back over to Cyborg, and Genie says that she's trying, but the transmission is being jammed. Would him and Aquaman like to play a game? Batman asks, Aquaman? And suddenly two smoke canisters are thrown at Batman's feet. Before he could even have a chance to react, he's thrown into the terminal and a mechanical arm shoots through, punching him in the face. As the smoke clears, the future Arthur Kirk Curry stands over Batman's body, blood dripping from his arms, telling him, It's been a long time. I'm gonna have to borrow some stuff. While Hunter, Diana's son, begins to stay with the Kent family, all the other children spend time with their soon-to-be parents. With no children of his own, Simon returns to Midway City to help with the quarantine of the people who were infected by the darkness. He moves through the bodies and he begins to hear something telling him, Here, like before, different, find, grow, feed, feast. Back with Hunter, Superman tells him that he's sorry if the clothes don't exactly fit, but Hunter looks at the room stating that this used to be his room. He lived here when Diana, well, he can remember everything about it. The bed sheets, the toys, the smell, everything. Hunter sits in the bed and he tells Superman, thanks. But before he can leave, he turns back asking, when the darkness takes over, what happens to John? Hunter tells him that John is just a little bit older than he is now, but he died by his father's side fighting. Superman then asks, what about Lois? And Hunter hangs his head telling him, I'm sorry. Silence fills the room and Superman places his hand on Hunter's shoulder telling him that they will beat this. They will find a way. Hunter looks up telling him that they couldn't before, not when the Kindred already sang. If they could, why didn't they stop it then? Superman says that they did. They saved everyone almost. They did the best that they could with what they knew at the time. They stopped the Purge, stopped the world breaking machines, and they stopped the Kindred. Hunter tells him, right, but they sang. That song doomed the world. You should have destroyed the Kindred. That's what we came here to do. Superman tells him, that would have killed thousands of innocent men and women. If I raised you, then you should know that you should never make that choice even knowing what 
you know now. Meanwhile, up in the Watchtower, Diana goes over the old files of their encounter with the Kindred and how she was taken in by them. They told her that soon she will know who she is, and Diana begins to question if maybe the war started with her. Back over at the Kent House, just before Hunter goes to bed, Cube sends him a message. He tells him that he was connected to the Watchtower, listening to everything that Diana was saying. Hunter tells him that if she's just now realizing this, that there's still a chance to save the world. They have to kill Wonder Woman. The next morning, Superman wakes up feeling weak. Lois runs over asking him what's wrong, and he struggles, and he manages to say, Kryptonite. Before she could finish asking where, Arthur Curry boom tubes in, stating, Here. And he slams a red solar flare down, telling Superman, This is courtesy of Bruce. He was well prepared to take you all down. Arthur begins beating Superman with the Kryptonite stone, and Lois grabs a bat and breaks it over Arthur's back. As she tries to hit him, he catches the next swing, telling her, Don't make me hurt you. None of this is your fault. The longer Lois looks, the sooner that she realizes that this is Arthur Curry, Aquaman. But before she can ask why he would even do this, he throws her into the wall and he picks up Superman's body and he leaves. Meanwhile, over in Nova Scotia, where the League fought the Kindred, Diana stands there in the rain, thinking how the Kindred sang their song, sending a signal, but to whom? Over in the woods behind her, though, Hunter and the others gather and Nora asks if he's sure about this. Hunter says that she gave birth to him, but she is not his mother. Serenity is coming and this is their only chance. Back in the field, Diana quietly listens to the kids, stating that she really doesn't want to do this. Without warning, Jenny and Jason fire their beams at Diana, but as Nora runs in to grab her, Diana grabs her with the lasso. She then knocks away the blast of the two twins, and then she's thrown to the ground by Hunter as he shouts, I will kill you! She tells him, don't make me do this, I will defend myself. And Hunter tells her, go ahead and bring it on, I've waited years for this. Over in Central City, Jessica and the Flash wake up to find their children already gone, but then something breaks through their window. Seconds later, Arthur bursts in, and when the temporal grenade goes off, Arthur looks at the Flash, telling him, it's amazing that you can even still move. And while he negates Jessica's ring, Arthur holds out his mechanical arm, stating that the grenade will wear off in three, two, one. As soon as the speed catches back up to the flash, he runs face first into the mechanical arm, falling to the ground. Jessica begins to see what's happening and asks, wait, Aquaman? Arthur pulls back his fist and he tells Jessica, it's lights out for you. Back in Nova Scotia, the fight with Diana continues and Hunter tells Cube to get the boom tube ready. As the portal opens, everyone is sucked in and then they are thrown out into Midway City. Hunter gets up asking, what the hell, where are we? And Cube tells him he's not sure, some weird interference brought them all here. As they look up, they see Simon's containment field in the darkness within building up. Everyone begins to state that it's already here, and at that time, Simon turns back, releasing the field. The darkness soon begins to spill out, all pouring out onto Diana. And over in Amnesty Bay, Serenity and Mara sit, watching the sun rise, as Serenity says some of her happiest moments were sitting here. Mara then asks, how is it that Arthur died? But rather than answer that, Serenity tells her that she died fighting, fighting until the very end. Mara then says, well, this is the kind of life that we lead. At least I got Arthur back. You're proof of that. Serenity gets up, and Mara asks what's wrong, as Serenity says that she didn't want to tell her, but Dad didn't die. It was worse. As Mero reaches out for her, Serenity's words trail off, and she asks, how? He shouldn't be here. From the shadows, Arthur steps out, and Mera turns to him. Serenity shouts to get away from him, and she will kill him if she has to. And Mera tells her, wait, this is your father, why would you? As Serenity yells, he stopped being my father a long time ago. You died because he wasn't there, and now he's with her. Mera touches Arthur's face, asking if he's here to hurt them. Is he gonna try and kill them? And Arthur closes his eyes, telling her, no, never you, but I'm sorry. He presses the button and a portal opens up, bringing Sovereign to their time. And he says, Sovereign has come to reclaim everything that she lost. She will burn the world to find it. Back at Midway City, the darkness runs through Diana, filling her head with thoughts. Tear them apart. Feel them bleed. Feel them die. As Steve Trevor goes to check on Diana, Simon steps in, stating, I don't want to have to kill you, but the voices are telling me I do. I have to make you scream. Jenny and Jason bring out the red and yellow light to counter Simon's green. And while the army starts to point their guns at him, Steve tells them all to stand down. Hunter tells Steve that this is the darkness. It wants us to kill each other. That's what it does. And that's what it did to the entire world. But this, this is all wrong. It wasn't supposed to happen yet. And Cube says, yeah, we were born years from now and we grew up before any of this even started. And Steve tells them, from my experience, folks coming from the future to fix things usually ends up making them worse. Jenny asks, what, you think this is our fault? And Steve says, you all tumbled in here and this just happened. So yeah, it's probably you. As the voices begin to fill Diana's head, she tells them all, I will kill you all, but not Hunter. My child, nurture him kill the rest! Diana begins to get back up, telling Steve that she can't hold back the darkness any longer. It is consuming her. It came with the children from the future. It was already here, but knowing its own future, it became stronger. They've already failed once and all died, but Hunter, keep him safe. Steve asks, why? Is it because he's your son? And Diana says, it's because he's the only one that it doesn't want me to kill. Seconds later, a loud boom can be heard, and Sovereign jumps down, knocking the army away. Right behind her, Serenity, Mara, and Arthur all jump out, and as Arthur tells Serenity to not get involved, Serenity pulls her armor away, telling him that they are her friends.
friends. They are more of a family to her than he ever was. As she runs in to fight, Mara says they're children. She can't stand by and watch. Can you? Arthur watches as everyone fights and then he sighs. <sighs> Damn it. But while it all happens, Simon begins to feel the darkness fading from him. And when he gets a chance, he breaks free of its control. He shouts for everyone to listen up, coordinate their attacks, and make it count. Let's make your parents proud. Elsewhere, in the black void, the Flash opens his eyes, stating, Okay, where the hell am I? Cyborg looks around asking, What just hit us? And Jessica says, Someone that looked like old Aquaman wearing Cyborg's body. Cyborg begins to pull up his systems, and after a quick scan, he says that it looks like they're at a pocket of folded space inside of a boom tube wormhole, which he should be able to get them out of. But first, there's something, a message from him, from the evil Aquaman. The video plays, and Arthur tells them that Sovereign wanted them dead. She thought that they'd stand in her way, but he is not the man that he was when they knew him. The world went to hell on him along with it. And when he came back and saw everyone again, he felt something that he hadn't felt in so many dark years, and that was hope. Sovereign has to be stopped, but there is only one life in this world that matters to her. Back at the fight, Sovereign holds everyone back as she rips into Simon's stomach. Diana screams for him to stop, but Sovereign slams her glaive down, blasting everyone away. As the smoke clears, she walks up to Diana, taking off her mask. And everyone looks at Sovereign, asking, Is that Hippolyta? And Hunter says, I didn't even know that. Just then a boom tube opens, and out come the four trapped heroes. And as Hippolyta touches Diana, the darkness begins to spread. The voice tells Diana to bring her friends into the darkness. They will take away their compassion and reason. Let hatred and violence rule their thoughts as they now rule herself. Now go, kill everyone in the whole world. Diana begins to lash out, but it's at Hippolyta. Hunter tells Steve to get his men out of here. They don't have the power to stop the Justice League. And Steve asks, and what? You do? Serenity tells him, you better hope we do. The voices ask Diana, what kind of a mother was she for her? Hippolyta killed so many in her name. Hate her! Diana punches Hippolyta down, taking her glaive and holding it above her head. And as she brings it down, Hunter jumps in, blocking the attack. Everyone begins to fight, struggling with their own parents, save for Superman and Arthur Curry. As Arthur tries to reason with Superman, Superman grabs the arm that is mostly mechanical and rips it off. Just then, the bat plane flies over and from out of it, Batman jumps out with a red solar flare. He slams it on the ground, telling Superman that Lois sent him to bring her husband back. And I damn well am going to, even if it kills me. As Mara starts to overpower Serenity, Serenity shouts that Arthur killed her. That's why she banished him from the water. Mara doesn't listen and instead goes into attack again, but before she could, Arthur throws himself in Mara's path. Mara's trident stabs into Arthur, and he tells Serenity, you need to get out of the way. Serenity blasts Mara away, asking why, and Arthur tells her it was because it was either one or the other. The darkness took us all so deep Deeply, there was no way back. Your mother was going to kill you, and that's why I had to stop her. I couldn't save Mara, but I wasn't going to let it take my daughter. I was damned every day since. Before the two could properly reconcile, Mara gets back up, stabbing into Arthur, shouting, I've always hated you! Over with Jenny and Jason, they hold Jessica back, shielding her from getting to Simon's body. But Jenny says that she can't hear Simon breathing. Maybe if he goes black and she goes white? Jason then asks, what, black and white? Death and life? Rebirth? At that moment, Simon gasps for air, and the green, white, and black light push Jessica away. Back with Hunter, now having the glaive, he beats into Diana and gets ready to deliver the final blow. Hippolyta tells him to wait. He doesn't know why she abandoned him so long ago. The darkness had infected her. She felt it. It conceived him. It whispered to her that you would be its embodiment, the new dark power hunter. Diana had given you up to save you. She held back the darkness long enough to give you to the people that she trusted the most, knowing that she was going to infect the world, the purpose that the kindred have given her. She took her own life by her own hand, but it was already too late. She abandons you out of love. This darkness is all the hatred, the fear, the rage, the intolerance that lies in the hearts of people who these heroes are here to protect. It took my daughter from me and I've hated the world for it ever since. Hunter helps Hippolyta up asking, how do we save her then? We couldn't beat the darkness in the future and it's stronger here than it was there. Then a bright indigo light shines and the twins rise above everyone. Jenny tells them, compassion. There is no anger, just compassion. No intolerance, only forgiveness. Forgiveness, no hate, only love. Suddenly the darkness lifts out of everyone contained in a ball of pure hate and vile rage. And as everyone gets up, they ask, what are they gonna do with it? Hippolyta gets up stating that she's sure that they can't destroy it. It might be contained in someone who is strong enough to hold it though. So she will be the one to do so. She will hold the darkness. Diana tells her to wait, but Hippolyta says that she must. After all she's done, she is saved and now maybe the future, but she has to do this. She just doesn't think she can do it alone. Arthur then stands up stating that she won't be alone. And Serenity says, wait, I just got back my father, but Arthur kisses her in the forehead, telling her, go home, all of you. You just might find what you've been looking for. Jenny and Jason push the darkness into both Hippolyta and Arthur, and Superman asks, 
Where will you go? Arthur tells him that they will leave by boom tube to nowhere, forever. Hippolyta looks back telling Diana that she is so glad that she found her again. She loves her so much. And one week later, the heroes and the kids gather at Amnesty Bay to say their final goodbyes after taking some time to recover. Mera hugs Serenity telling her that she will miss her, even if it's only for a few years. And Flash tells Nora and the twins that, of course, they won't cease to exist. They already exist now. Alternate timelines, divergent futures, it's all good. You either will exist for us or you won't, but you will exist for yourself. Diana tells Hunter that if she's there in the future, give her a chance. And he says that he is blessed to be her son, and hopefully he'll remember how proud he feels right now. As everyone gets ready, Jenny asks, do they really think the future will be any different? Jessica tells her that's why they keep fighting. With that, the ring of light appears and the children are gone. And Batman asks, what about you? Do you think the future will be any different now? The Superman tells him, it's out there waiting for us. So let's go find out. And there you have it, the Justice League Children of the League storyline. Now, this was interesting because at the time that this book came out, none of us were huge fans of it as we were trying to figure out how it fit into Rebirth. It felt so weird and out of place. But looking at it as a separate entity with its own timeline and its own storyline, it's actually a lot of fun. I really did enjoy what they did with the storyline. The art was on point. The storyline felt really good. And while some of the characters felt a little different from how they were being portrayed in other books, they weren't so far off that you couldn't see this actually happening, such as Barry Allen and Jessica Cruz dating. I had a lot of fun with it and I hope you did as well. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. You, sir or ma'am, are a superhero for sticking around to the ending of this. And I'll see you guys next time, right here at the Comic Story and Channel.